Deus Ex is a series held in very high regard. It's one of the originators of the immersive sim genre. It's been lifted up to the status of prophetic. The original game has transcended critical status, sitting in many minds as a perfect game. Outside of that first entry, the series has had its ups and downs, sometimes faltering, sometimes trying again to find that greatness, and sometimes falling in between. I will say, though, that the series doesn't have a genuinely bad game. Every single entry has something to see, something worth picking up and giving it at least some of your time. When we as fans spend a lot of these modern days begging for the unique, interesting, and immersive, we can't really complain when we haven't taken a look at Deus Ex. Some of these entries concern themselves more with the conspiracy of the world, pushing themselves toward the neo-futurism of the early 2000s. Others focus more on transhumanism, what it means to be different or augmented. But at its core, every Deus Ex game shares the same values, giving the player the choice and freedom to explore the game's scenarios in any way that they choose. It's in this freedom that genuine fun and creativity is allowed to bloom. The freedom is the catalyst, and the catalyst creates something even bigger, a genuine gaming experience. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at the Deus Ex series. First, I'll be looking at each individual game in the series. Deus Ex, Deus Ex Invisible War, Deus Ex Human Revolution, and Deus Ex Mankind Divided. After that, we'll take a look at the spin-off mobile game, Deus Ex The Fall, the supplementary materials of the expanded Deus Ex universe, two full-length novels, two novellas, two short limited-run comics, and one one-shot. Taking a look at all of this content should give us a picture of the series in general and how it's held up over time as well as its impact. If you enjoy this content and want to see more, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel as it really helps me out. If you'd like to support the channel further, you can subscribe to the Patreon, where I upload longer versions of my full retrospectives when there's extra content to be had scattered text posts, and early access to videos occasionally. You can also follow me on Twitch, where I sometimes play games that I'm not currently reviewing. I also just want to point out that if you've already seen the individual retrospectives, you can skip to the section Past Mankind Divided. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Deus Ex. Deus Ex began development in 1997. John Romero, who was still running Ion Storm at that time, had approached Warren Spector and told him to develop the game of his dreams. Spector had worked as an editor at Space Gamer magazine and eventually went on to work on quite a few tabletop role-playing games, which actually has a lot more to do with Deus Ex's development than you think. He worked on GURPS, Top Secret, and Marvel Super Heroes. He eventually entered the video game industry by joining Origin, who had made games like Ultima 3 Exodus, Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar, Ultima 5 Warriors of Destiny, and Ogre. Spectre would go on to produce Ultima 6, Wing Commander, and many other games at Origin. He bounced around a bit and was supposed to work on a game with EA when he got this massive offer from John Romero to join Ion Storm. At the time, Spectre had already wanted to make a game called Troubleshooter. It was supposed to be set in the real world and be a massive big budget action shooter. This was the game that would later become Deus Ex. Spectre's idea was to make a world where conspiracies had become reality. Set in the future of the 2050s, governments had run rampant and exerted incredible control over the populaces of the world. Spectre was a very specific and picky overlord for this development. He had tons of commandments that the team had to follow and could not break. 
His specific ideas didn't just extend to story, though. They also permeated the realm of gameplay. Spectre was frustrated at the time by multiple genres. He was angry at shooters because he died so much, he was angry at stealth games because they didn't let him fight, and he was angry at role-playing games because they were all set in the same boring fantasy landscape. He wanted to break these conventions and create something that combined all of these genres into one. Not only that, but he wanted the player to choose which of the genres they would play throughout the game. Spectre wanted to give the players agency for the gameplay, allowing them to choose how they approached situations, but the narrative was to stay linear. Spectre describes the narrative of Deus Ex as what you are doing and the why you are doing it, but not the how you are doing it. This was reserved for the gameplay. Spectre himself describes this as the pleasure of creativity or unique experiences. The list of inspirations that the team took to develop their aesthetic and story was miles long. Games like Half-Life, Fallout, Thief, Goldeneye, movies like Colossus, The Forbin Project, The Manchurian Candidate, Robocop, Blade Runner, and even shows like X-Files were responsible for the developers setting their sights on conspiracies. I do have to give a ton of credit to Warren Spector here. Watching and reading through tons of interviews with him, he seems like a guy that's genuinely wanted to make the game of his dreams, and he's incredibly grateful that he got to do that. He also seems humble, someone that is able to recognize that the players and their interpretations of the games are just as big of a part of making the game what it is as the team itself. I feel like I have to point this out sometimes when I'm talking about older games. We have a modern landscape where developers, at least larger ones, tend to have an attitude of, I know better than you. So it can be genuinely refreshing to look at this old crop of devs who just seemed excited to make the games that they enjoyed. Spectre's dream grew into a reality, though. It may have taken a bit longer than planned. The game's scope grew as the production went on, and they also ran into some management structure issues. But nonetheless, Deus Ex was released for Microsoft Windows on June 23rd, 2000. Before we get into things, I'd like to talk about the edition of Deus Ex that I played. Deus Ex was originally released on Windows, but the Game of the Year edition was released almost a year later on May 8th, 2001. It was a slightly updated version of the game with the most recent patch and a very short list of updates to the maps. These changes mostly include moving items or grates into specific spots, but overall very little difference. There was also a version of Deus Ex released on the PlayStation 2 called Deus Ex The Conspiracy. This version of the game is very different, smaller sectioned maps, layout changes, lower resolution textures, but higher resolution character models. The game's biggest difference though lies in its intro and ending cutscenes, which are pre-rendered compared to the original in-game cutscenes. Overall, I chose the Game of the Year version of this game. This is mostly because it's the only one that's distributed on storefronts today. This came with its own set of problems though, because on modern hardware, this game can be pretty broken. I had to install tons of different fan patches to get the game to work properly, and even then I still got tons of bugs throughout my playthrough. One persistent issue was the game going to a black screen randomly, forcing me to restart. It was something I had to deal with, but it's a shame that games like this don't get the preservation that they deserve, especially considering what a masterpiece this is. I should also mention that some of these mods include one that upgraded the visuals of Deus Ex slightly. This just really improves lighting and some models, but sometimes it had the opposite effect with the lights throbbing at certain points throughout the playthrough. Deus Ex actually begins with a training mission. This tutorial takes us through most parts of the combat and gameplay systems, using weapons, hiding bodies, healing, stealth. I'll get into gameplay a bit more in depth once we get there, but this tutorial section is entirely optional. It provides a really good base for Deus Ex's systems. I do think that the better tutorial area is actually the first mission of the game itself, which acts as a proving ground. Before we get to that mission, we actually get to create our character. 
Well, technically speaking, we do, but this isn't the traditional role-playing character creation. We don't get a blank slate and get to do whatever we want. Our character's name will always be J.C. Denton, but we can pick his real name, which will be mentioned a few times in emails and notes. This is important to note, because like we talked about before, Deus Ex doesn't give you full freedom with its narrative. It isn't a role-playing game per se, it's a mishmash of multiple genres. Every other area is where this game truly lets you roam free. The important choice we get to make here is skills. This is our leveling system for the game. We get skill points by completing objectives, and we can use these to upgrade our skill levels in multiple categories. Some of these, like swimming and environmental training, can be pretty useless, as there are items in the game that will let us swim without a higher skill level. Computer, electronics, lockpicking, and all the weapon skills are pretty important, though. Each skill has four levels and generally determines how proficient you are with a weapon or how fast you can complete a task. We get an intro scene here. Two characters are having a conversation. Two men who we don't know yet, but seem to be controlling some very high-level matters. This small scene sets the tone for the world of Deus Ex. The year is 2052, and a plague is running rampant across the United States. The Grey Death is killing tons of people, and the only cure is something called Ambrosia. These two men seem to want this virus to run rampant, to kill as many people as possible. The general story is, though, that the cure is being stolen by terrorist forces, like the NSF, to hoard it all for themselves, which is why the populace can't get any. But as we see from this conversation, this really isn't the case. We start our first mission on Liberty Island in New York. We play as J.C. Denton, a new recruit to UNATCO, the United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition. In the world of Deus Ex, mechanical augmentations for soldiers have been a thing for a while. These augmentations give soldiers superhuman abilities, but now JC is one of two soldiers that have nano augmentations. These nanites give soldiers even more powers than mechanics ever could. Seeing in the dark, going unseen from the human eye, shirking off damage from bullets. The only other soldier to have these augmentations is JC's brother, Paul Denton. We meet Paul on the pier. He tells us about our first mission. The NSF have stolen a shipment of Ambrosia and are trapped inside the Statue of Liberty, which has already been hit by terrorist attacks before this. The NSF are the National Secessionist Forces. To give a bit of backstory to the world, back in 2030, over 20 years before the game begins, AIDS was running rampant in the US. The same year that it was cured, a massive earthquake hit the southwestern coast of the country. This caused most of Southern California to be destroyed. After this, the U.S. fell into turmoil, both financial and physical. A lot of states started to secede and form their own secessionist force. As we begin the game, we are working against these forces. UNATCO was formed to stop terrorist threats like these. I would like to note here that a lot of the lore information that I'm going to be talking about isn't explicitly stated through cutscenes in the game. Some of this information comes from the myriad of lore books that we can find throughout our adventure, and a lot of it comes from something called the Deus Ex Bible. This was an incredibly interesting piece of information that was posted by the developers on GameSpy in 2002. It was effectively their game design document and acts as a huge lore dump. Tons of information on the state of the world, the history, more background information on characters. It was so much of a definitive statement on the world of the game that developers of future entries in the series would use it as a sacred text to make sure they got the details right going in. Paul gives us a choice of a weapon here, a rifle, gep gun, or a crossbow. On my first playthrough, I picked the crossbow, thinking this would be the best option for stealth, and boy was I wrong. Before we get into the intricacies of weapons, we should probably talk about how Deus Ex actually plays. This is exactly what we're introduced to when we start Liberty Island. 
While I don't think Liberty Island is the most perfect level in this game, I do think that it is the perfect starting level for this game. As we talked about in the development section, Deus Ex was meant to give players the agency to approach gameplay situations as they please. Whether you want to run and gun, blast your way into the buildings, or sneak around and take out enemies undetected, even talk to other characters to find hidden passageways or extra secrets, it's entirely up to you. And once you enter on one path, you aren't restricted from changing to another. This is exactly what Deus Ex does. It gives you the true freedom to decide what you want the game to be. It does it in the most pure and genuine sense imaginable as well. Today, we've seen this before, it's not anything new, but Deus Ex was one of the progenitors of the immersive sim genre. If you aren't sure what an immersive sim is, that's fine, because people that like immersive sims aren't really even sure what an immersive sim is either. Generally, the genre can be described as putting player choice at the forefront, allowing the player to use creative methods to approach different situations. The genre also has some other staples, like being able to pick up random items that seemingly have no use. They also generally have interconnected maps and have a pretty open level design. Some staples of the genre are Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which heavily leans more into the role-playing aspect of the genre, Thief, System Shock, and Deus Ex itself. But the genre is really so vague that some people lump the Elder Scrolls games in here, Bioshock, and even Pathologic. All great games, but whether they're immersive sims or not is debatable. It's actually a never-ending conversation. But one thing we can be certain of is that Deus Ex is an immersive sim. It actually pioneered the genre, and back in the year 2000, this was massively revolutionary. Deus Ex isn't just impressive or interesting for the year 2000, though. It's impressive today as well. In my mind, there are sort of two approaches to any situation in Deus Ex, stealth and attack. Stealth requires you to slip through the shadows, find hidden grates in the walls to traverse through, hack computer systems to turn off cameras and turrets, lockpick doors and take out enemies from behind. Not being seen is paramount if you're trying to stealth, then getting seen is the real enemy. Once this happens, the alarms start blaring, you're caught, and you have to retreat back into the darkness. The other approach, attack, is much more loud. This sees you using explosives to blow up doors that are in your way, attacking enemies head-on, blowing up machines, and using augmentations to run past turrets. These are the two clear ways to approach, but the game isn't exactly that 50-50. That's exactly where the genius lies. Warren Spector describes the story of Deus Ex as a character that sees the world as black and white, realizing that there's so much more gray than he ever understood. This doesn't just describe the story, it describes the gameplay of Deus Ex itself and the journey of the player throughout the course of the game. In real life, we are J.C. Denton, seeing two potential paths throughout the game and realizing there is way more fun to be had here than we even understand. We can turn turrets on enemies to take them out for us. We can rush through a level, scrambling equipment and running right past it. One of the later levels allows you to traverse over top of a base, skipping entire areas. These aren't exploits, they're part of the game. The team themselves have stated that players had to teach them how to play the game, and this is what it's all about, finding new solutions to the problems that the game presents you with. Spectre also talks a lot about the way he views games against other media like film or books. He says that other media gives you statements. This is the way things are. Games ask you questions and let you answer them. Deus Ex's gameplay lets you answer as many questions as you want, maybe like no other game ever has. We can use a variety of different weapons in Deus Ex, a regular pistol, a stealth pistol to go in quiet, an assault rifle, shotguns, a sniper rifle, a gep gun that blasts enemies away. Most of these weapons can be modified to increase their range, accuracy, and recoil. I personally used a sniper rifle for most of the second half of the game with a suppressor on it. It was deadly accurate, highly damaging, and mostly quiet. 
We can use EMP grenades to take out enemy equipment. We can use lambs to blow up doors, enemies themselves, or massive robots. Taking out enemies quietly can be done by whacking them with a baton from behind, but if they notice us, we can shock them and quickly run around their back to take them out before they hit us. On top of that, there are a ton of augmentations in the game exclusive to JC and his brother. We get these gradually over the course of the story. We usually get to choose between two and then upgrade those along the way. These can range from a cloaking device that enables us to go unseen, a device that heals us incredibly quickly, one that lets us see in the dark. These are all powered by bioelectric energy, which we have to keep an eye on. This meter can be refilled with biocells, just like health, but it can drain pretty fast depending on which AUG we're using. I've played a lot of narrative choice games before, games like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, or Fable, games where the story is shaped by the choices that you make along the way. That can usually feel pretty free, but it generally feels like there's a veil somewhere. There's a thin curtain, and you know as soon as you pull it back, the illusion will be gone. You've found out the trick. Deus Ex is different. You're given freedom with gameplay, not narrative. There are some narrative choices that we can make along the way here, but they're generally pretty limited. Deus Ex gives you the keys to the kingdom from the very beginning, though. No longer are we constrained to long corridor dungeons with one or two branching paths and an extra chest off to the side. It almost feels like we have a whole world to experience here, and we're allowed to do it however we please. This can seem almost overwhelming at first, like, what am I supposed to do with all these tools? You've given me too much choice. Return me to the padded room. I'd like a straight and narrow corridor, please. But eventually, it just clicks. There's a moment where you just understand it. You understand the freedom of approach and the value of that. I will say that I've never really been a big fan of stealth, and I've only played a handful of immersive sims. Usually in stealth games I choose to run and gun, but I wanted to challenge myself with Deus Ex. I wanted to try and stealth as much as I could. I did stealth for quite a bit of Deus Ex, but I quickly realized that it wasn't about stealth or not stealth. It's about doing whatever the fuck you want. That's why the game is so great, because it's yours, not someone else's. In that freedom is paradise. This freedom is nowhere better showcased than in the first level. Here we have a single goal, to invade the terrorist group that's holed up in the Statue of Liberty. We can go through the main gate that's guarded by a powerful robot, we can go around back and sneak inside by climbing on some boxes, we can talk to Harley Philbin at the North Docks to get a key for the doors. There are a lot of ways to go about this situation, and the level itself isn't the best in the game. It's kind of small, there's not a ton going on here, and it isn't the most visually interesting outside of the decapitated Statue of Liberty, which clearly sets the tone and theme for the game with a massive visual metaphor. But if you think of this level as unreal, as a sort of tryout for the real thing, then I think it really works. This is the moment to figure things out, to test the boundaries of the simulation that we found ourselves in. Each mission usually has some optional objectives that we can complete as well. These give us skill points, but could also affect later missions, affect the mission we're currently in, or give us better weapons and ammo. I took the optional objective to rescue Gunther, another UNATCO agent that had been captured by NSF forces. Once we get to the top of the statue, we find the terrorist leader and realize that the Ambrosia has already left. He thinks the government made the plague on purpose for population control. He throws some statistics our way to try and convince us that things aren't as cut and dry as they seem. Number one, in 1945, corporations paid 50% of federal taxes. Now they pay about 5%. Number two, in 1900, 90% of Americans were self-employed. Now it's about 2%. So? It's called consolidation. Strengthen governments and corporations, weaken individuals. This is the first indication that the game gives us that the NSF might not be what they've been made out to be. He also cites things like the Trilateral Commission, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds. One of the best things about Deus Ex's writing is that it bases its 
current political climate off of real-world conspiracy theories from the 90s. This makes the situation feel way more genuine. We're not talking about random people here, new characters in a fictional world. This is our world in the future. It creates a way more genuine world than if the team had just created real-life allegories. One of Deus Ex's huge strengths, a large reason that it still holds up today, is because people consider it to be quite prophetic. A game that was released in 2000 talking about the future 50 years later has a world racked by viruses, terrorism, conspiracy, government surveillance, and a lack of online privacy, even down to the New York skyline not having the Twin Towers. Now, of course, these were all things that had been talked about for quite some time. The developers aren't exactly Nostradamus, but it really hits home and is one of the reasons that Deus Ex still works, especially post-2020. I also have to say, personally, I was a huge conspiracy goblin in middle school. A perhaps too early obsession with the X-Files created a teen that knew the truth was out there. I perused the internet quite often in the search for this holy grail of truth, whether in the form of aliens, government corruption, or anything sinister. Looking back on it now, it was mostly a form of entertainment for me. At the time, everything I saw online was an extension of the X-Files. These were just larger mysteries of fiction that were based around real-world events. I think that's how a lot of people used to enjoy conspiracy, at least from my perspective. That isn't to say there haven't always been people who take things too far. I just think it was far less common then. Also, don't misconstrue my points here. I always suggest a healthy mistrust of your government, but it's clear that today, conspiracy theory can no longer be enjoyed as a form of entertainment. It's become far too real for most people, and the art of the conspiracy theory has mostly been lost to time, mangled into something that I don't really recognize anymore. It's a far cry from watching videos of UFOs and trying to find documentation about Roswell on the internet in 2005. Deus Ex and things like it resurrect that for me, that interest, that intrigue, that feeling that something sinister is going on and you're going to find out what it is but in a fictional world. It's almost like a mix between a government noir story and a massive spy thriller. The NSF terrorist leader is taken in and JC is ordered to report back to the UNATCO headquarters, which happens to be right next to the Statue of Liberty. Manderly, the head of UNATCO, wants to brief us on our next mission. We can read tons of emails and books in the headquarters that further contextualize the world around Deus Ex. These memos usually give some sort of background on a character or the current political state. These are mostly supplementary, not necessary, but furthering the knowledge of the Deus Ex world will only further your experience of the game itself. We can talk to Anna Navarre and Gunther Herman, two fellow UNATCO agents. We can also go into the woman's restroom, which is a big no-no. Manderly will even scold us for it later, which I thought was hilarious. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. By the way, Ditton, stay out of the ladies' restroom. That kind of activity embarrasses the agency more than it does you. Our real goal is to talk to Jaime Reyes, the UNATCO doctor, and Alex Jacobson, the communications engineer. Alex is the one that mostly gives us orders in the field and helps out with our objectives. We can also talk to Sam Carter, who will give us some equipment for our next mission. Once we talk to Manderley and get our next mission, we have to go after the NSF's stolen ambrosia. JC's job is to knock out a generator so that Paul can get in and take out the terrorist forces. We head with Anna first and have to infiltrate a castle where a store of ambrosia is being held. Once we find the ambrosia, we can head over to the subway and save some hostages. We finally meet Paul in Hell's Kitchen, and this is where the game starts to open up a bit. Deus Ex will never rival the mass open worlds we have today, sprawling cities or full-to-the-brim taverns and RPGs, but it does have something that those games don't. Style. This aspect is something I've always struggled to explain in games. The games that have this sense of aesthetic and design are few and far between. 
Before I've described this as soul or comfy, they're games that make you feel like you're at home. You feel like you're at rest. You aren't working against a system. You're having fun. But it's not easy to put this into words. What makes a game feel like it has a mortal core that gives life to sentient beings? What makes a game make you feel good? In Jesse Shell's The Art of Game Design, he states that to take the risk of immersing yourself in a fantasy world, we like to be in a safe place, either alone or surrounded by the people we know and trust. He likens this liminal reality that the experience of a game takes place in as a hearth. In his context, Shell is referring more to communal aspects of games, playing the Wii with your family when you're young, for example. But I think this hearth is nonetheless a poignant metaphor. It can be difficult for a game to make you relax, and it's not even always necessary. Some games want to make you scared, some want you to feel tense, and trust me, there are tense moments in Deus Ex. When you're following a guard down a hallway, ready to take them out with your baton, hoping that they don't turn around at the last second, and then they do. You kill them, but the facility alarms are blaring, screeching in your ears. You have to make a quick decision to hide or to fight. It's true anxiety in the moment. But overall, the general design of Deus Ex makes us feel at home. It makes us feel a part of something larger. It makes you feel relaxed. You can almost feel the glow of your parents' monitor on your face as you sit up late, way past your bedtime, the volume turned down on the speakers, telling yourself just one more mission. Don't confuse this feeling for nostalgia, either. I've never played Deus Ex as a kid, but everything that this game does is put together in a package that makes you feel like you've just arrived, after a long journey, and it's finally time to take some rest. I think that a large part of this game's feel is its OST. It's a masterpiece of sound. It's somehow both hard-hitting and wistful at the same time. The action themes, like the one on Liberty Island, is heavy, grandiose, with a feeling of patriotism permeating the background. Tracks like the Battery Park action theme are upbeat and bouncy. A myriad of interesting synths and instruments plot this whole track. Each area even has its own death theme, which is just impressive in and of itself. Offering a new track each time you die in an area is just wild. There's also something to be said about the main title theme, which just represents the story and adventure we're about to go on. It's massive, a wide scope, trying to at once convey subterfuge and conspiracy, while also pushing through themes of adversity and freedom on top of it. There is one song on the OST that's my favorite, though, the credits theme, or as it's titled on the official release, The Illuminati. This song just goes hard. It rips through with hard riffs and open synths. Throughout the track, it evolves into something else that feels seedy, underground, like hiding after a win. 
The whole soundtrack is terrific. It perfectly reflects the game itself and it is a massive part of why playing this game feels so good in the first place. I haven't stopped playing these songs since I beat the game. Once we get into Hell's Kitchen, we can head to the Underworld Tavern. Here we can talk to some people, learn about a local thug named Jojo, get some information on the NSF generator, and talk to an interesting man named Jock. Jock used to be a military test pilot and has a ton of his own theories about what the government has going on at Area 51. We can go to a nearby hotel and stop a hostage situation that's plaguing the owner, Mr. Renton. We can then visit Paul's apartment, where he's left us some nice equipment in a hidden room behind a false bookcase. It should be noted here that we can see signs of distress in Paul's room, both in the environment design, but also the things he's reading. This tells us that his character probably isn't handling his new augmentations too well, or possibly something deeper. Deus Ex does this a lot, telling its story through its environment. We can also visit the smuggler in his hideout who will sell us some items. He wanted me to save his friend, so I did that. We have to head to the rooftops and make our way to that generator eventually, though. We can start taking out troops, and this is where my addiction to the sniper rifle began. Once we destroy the generator, Jack takes us out of there in a black helicopter. He'll be our signature pilot from here on out. Back at the office, we have to see Manderley, but we can eavesdrop on his conversation with Walton Simmons. Just fire the arrogant son of a bitch. I wasn't exaggerating. He's our best agent. We don't need him. We've got his brother, and more on the way. He knows nothing. I think he does. You should never have sent him to Hong Kong. Let's be sensible. We have to look at the whole record. Walton Simmons happens to be the director of FEMA and is pretty high up in the hierarchy of control. Manderley tells us Paul went offline, and it seems like he might have defected. We have to take his spot and get the Ambrosia back from the terrorists. There's an interesting little extra scene that we can get here with Walton Simmons. When he walks away, he says that he's going to interrogate some terrorists. We can head downstairs to see him doing this. He's not exactly being nice, and eventually he shoots both of them. Before we leave on the next mission, we see some MIB agents outside of the headquarters. Squeeze on Manderley about this one. Get on the helicopter, Mr. Denton. Simons did not appreciate your interference. We're dropped off in the subway and meet Harley Philbin, who lets us down into a secret phone booth entrance that takes us into the subway. We have to get acquainted with the Mole People, who are homeless that live in the underground tunnels of the city. This is a real term that references a real phenomena. People have been known to live in the abandoned parts of the New York City subway stations, most notably covered in the documentary Dark Days. Taking these mole people tunnels, we eventually reach an NSF helibase. We recover most of the ambrosia and are supposed to track down a man named Juan Lebedev, who is funding the NSF. When we find Paul, though, we realize what the director said was right. Paul is a part of the NSF. He's defected. He thinks that the Grey Death was man-made, and the government is controlling the cure. The NSF can use Ambrosia to make more of a cure. He wanted me to hear out Lebedev, but when I found him, Anna was already there. She was going to kill him, even though that was against UNATCO rules. Our goal is to kill Lebedev, but we don't actually have to do that. We can kill Lebedev, kill Anna, or kill both of them. I chose to save Lebedev. Alex wasn't too happy about this, but he figured I had my own reasons. This choice won't wildly affect the game overall, but it will affect conversations moving forward. It's not that we get to choose the narrative here, it's just that the system allows us the freedom to do what we want, and that includes killing NPCs sometimes. We talk to Gunther after this, who thinks Anna might be in trouble, but we just lie our way out. The Coalition is completely against Paul at this point, he is now the enemy. Back at UNATCO, Manderley suspects us of killing Navarre, or at least covering up for Paul. Apparently, they've activated Paul's kill switch, a back door that was built into his augmentations. Both of our augmentations. Luckily, they take some time to have an effect. Now we have to head to Hong Kong to track down Paul. Before we get there, we meet Paul in his apartment. He's too injured to leave, and he wants us to send out an NSF beacon. He tells us we'll get proof of the NSF's innocence at their headquarters. 
Once we send out the beacon, there's no turning back, and we're the enemy of UNATCO. Every UNATCO agent starts attacking us, and we have to escape. When we head back to Paul, he tells us that Simmons is actually part of an organization called Majestic 12. They've been using FEMA to try and shut down the U.S. government. MIB agents then invade the room. These guys are pretty strong, and they explode when they die. We can fight them and try to save Paul or just leave him, but either way, it's a scripted death because we get knocked out and wake up in an unknown location, captured. Someone called Daedalus contacts us and helps us escape. We have to make our way through the Majestic 12 base, using the vents to get around. We'll encounter multiple creatures that are being either synthesized or examined here. Lizard people and massive beasts we can unleash on the MJ-12 agents. Turns out this entire place is underneath the UNATCO headquarters, and we have to get out. We can convince some of the UNATCO people to leave the organization. We find out that MJ-12 actually took control away from the previous ruling cabal, the Illuminati. Bob Page is now the one controlling everything. Now that I wasn't a part of UNATCO, I could go into the women's restroom all I wanted. Sweet. When we find Manderley, he's in big trouble with Simmons over everything that's happened. I decided to kill him. I escaped and Jock was on my side, so he was going to take me to Hong Kong. We get stopped for a quick detour at an MJ-12 base and have to escape there as well. Hong Kong is a great area. The whole design and aesthetic is one of the best areas in the game. Unfortunately though, it's where the story starts to drag a little bit. It's not a huge downgrade, it's just this middle of the game lull that isn't the best. I do think the area itself is fantastic though. The change of scenery and aesthetic is very welcome and provides a fresh new design for us to look at for a while. Our overall goal here is to find Tracer Tong because he might be able to help us disable both JC and Paul's kill switches. Before we do this though, we have to get involved in some triad disputes. We have to make peace between two factions so that we can find Tracer himself. We also get a pretty damn good melee weapon in the process called the Dragon's Tooth Sword. This thing kills most everything in one hit and is a perfect weapon to use for just about the rest of the game. We eventually meet Tong who turns off our kill switch. Paul is on his way to Hong Kong, but we have to finish dealing with the triad dispute. We have to sneak into Versalife to find the ROM encoding for the sword. We sneak into the facility that we saw from the beginning of the game, the veritable sword of Damocles hanging over the earth just happens to be in the shape of a hand. I think it's worth noting the situation here. Now that we've separated from UNATCO, become an enemy of the state and cabal, and are full-on working towards some sort of freedom or peace, there's something to be said about how playing the game reflects this freedom. With player agency and choice of approach put at the forefront, you can't stop thinking about the fact that this mirrors the story itself. A man who thinks in black and white, J.C. Denton, but also you, the player, is introduced to a world of moral grays. This is, again, both J.C. Denton being introduced to the upending of his own world and what he thought was right and wrong, and you, the player, being introduced to the freedom of approaching situations, not just by blowing up enemies head-on or sneaking around and stealing, but maybe some strange new combination of those things. In this facility, we can find some more of Majestic 12's experiments, like a full-on gray alien dead on a table. We have to make a quick escape from the labs and we solve the dispute between the triads. Tong wants us to head back into the facility though, so that we can find out how they manufacture the virus. We head through a back entrance and end up destroying MJ-12's machine that manufactures the gray death. Tong then tells us about the Illuminati. They were the organization that was in control before MJ-12. They consider themselves more benevolent rulers than the ones that followed. Our job is now to seek out Morgan Everett, one of the Illuminati heads in Paris. Before we leave, we meet up with Paul, who's also had his kill switch turned off. It's also not certain that Paul even appears at this point in the game. The same with any of the killable characters from before. If he died back in Hell's Kitchen, then he just won't be here. It doesn't affect the story a ton, it's just worth noting that these optional conversations will be gone. We head to New York and meet with Stanton Dowd, another member of the Council of Five, the previous ruling faction. He directs us to the Brooklyn Naval Shipyard where he thinks Majestic 12 is storing the virus. 
Here, we can either meet harsh resistance or some helpful soldiers that will let us in. If we talk to one of the Navy men back in Hell's Kitchen, he'll tell us that he wants to know what the government has been doing at their shipyard. This causes him to let some of his men know ahead of time that we're coming and they let us through. These little options are always a great addition to the game. They're not mandatory, and there's really no way we'd know about them if we didn't go out of our way to chat with people and explore. But that's the point. Deus Ex hides all of its little secrets from you in an effort to push you out of your comfort zone. It wants to make you work to find its little variants and hidden helpers. This also lends to the replayability of the game, which is just massive. The game isn't just replayable, it begs to be replayed. It wants you to come back time and time again. And in an age where games just slap a new game plus mode on everything, this is a welcome relic from a lost era. A game where the nature of multiple playthroughs was baked into the design, not an afterthought. We sneak into the shipyard, which is just a massive place. It's crawling with soldiers, attack bots, cameras, turrets, anything and everything security. It's a fortress, and infiltrating it can take a while. As Deus Ex nears its conclusions, its missions start to become longer and longer. We aren't exploring the outskirts of the Statue of Liberty anymore. We're lost inside these huge labyrinths of construction sneaking down alleyways, using anything we can to try and find our way. There are no maps in-game. Well, there are, but they're just pictures. They serve only to give us an idea of where we might be or have to go, but everything else is up to our memory. We eventually board the ship and find out that Captain Zhao was being extorted into working for MJ-12. This is possibly how they exact all of their control over the people that work for them. We have to plant lambs throughout the entire ship, taking it down in a blaze of glory. Afterwards, we head to a mansion and sneak into some catacombs to find Stanton Dowd again. Dowd tells us that Everett was the one originally working on the virus. It was originally meant to help with augmentations, but Bob Page turned it into a weapon. Daedalus wants us to go to Paris as well to find Everett. This is quickened when MJ-12 invades Dowd's estate. We have to escape through the catacombs and head to Paris. Once there, we have to make contact with Silhouette, another supposed terrorist group that has ties to the NSF. The leader wants us to rescue some of his agents who have been captured by MJ-12. Once they're safe, the leader tells us to head to a local club to find Nicolette Duclair. Nicolette is the daughter of Beth Duclair, one of the other members of the Council of Five. Beth was assassinated, but Nicolette might have some idea of where Morgan Everett is. She tells us that MJ-12 were terrified of the Illuminati and killed her mother. She takes us to the Duclair estate to look for clues about Everett's location. Here we can investigate the house, finding keys behind paintings, and eventually getting in contact with Everett himself. Everett first wants us to access a piece of data that's at a nearby Templar cathedral. The Illuminati takes their root in the Templars themselves, their legacy running back hundreds of years. Before we can gather the data, Gunther tries to stop us. He's still loyal to Unatco and won't see the truth, so it's time to end him. Simmons contacts JC before he leaves. He's not confident the Rebels will be able to synthesize a cure for the Grey Death, mostly because they need a universal constructor, a complicated machine that aids in the creation of a cure. We're finally about to meet Everett, but we're contacted by a strange person named Icarus, then Bob Page himself, who says we're just a prototype. We get taken to Everett's building. Here we can do quite a lot of investigating to find some really interesting stuff. First, we can enter a secret room behind a mirror in his bathroom. This leads us to Lucius De Beers. We find out that he's being kept here, frozen on ice until the technology to revive him comes to fruition. De Beers was the previous head of the Illuminati, and Everett has been using him for advice. We can talk to Everett about this, and he says that he's been keeping De Beers alive solely to help him. He could have revived him years ago. We tell De Beers this, and he's furious, but can't do anything. We can actually shut off his vitals here to put him out of his misery, but Everett gets pretty mad at us. And then there's another secret room we can access with, possibly the definitive moment in Deus Ex. To provide some backstory, Daedalus, the AI that's been communicating with us, was created by MJ-12 to surveil the populace. Daedalus went rogue, and Icarus was created to replace it. 
In the secret room, we find Morpheus, the prototype for all these AI. It's the true moment when JC is faced with the philosophical questions of the situation at hand. This man that has viewed the world in black and white is finally confronted with the true gray. It brings up questions like, what is God? Is God man-made? What is control and surveillance? Do these things have impact? Are they not as they seem? It's an honest conversation, maybe one that JC really isn't ready to have, but one that the player didn't yet know they wanted. This conversation quenches a thirst that we've subconsciously had since the beginning of the game. No one will ever worship a software entity peering at them through a camera. The human organism always worships. First, it was the gods. Then, it was fame, the observation and judgment of others. The sequence was originally meant to provide backstory and give context to the world, but Sheldon Picotti, one of the writers, wanted to use it to tie themes together. There was also originally going to be a text parser that would let you ask questions to Morpheus, but the team felt that the resources weren't there to create something for just one small moment. At this point, Everett needs us to go to the Vandenberg Air Base where we can find Gary Savage, an ex-Area 51 scientist who is working on a universal constructor. This will get us closer to making a cure for the virus. There's something going on with the copter, though. We have the option here of killing the mechanic in Everett's building. Turns out he's a spy and planted a bomb on the plane. If we don't kill him, then Jock will die later in the game. We have to infiltrate Vandenberg and eventually talk to Gary Savage. At this point, Icarus and Daedalus merge into one being, Helios. This is part of Paige's final plan, and he's also captured Savage's daughter. We have to rescue her so that he can keep working on the cure. JC makes his way through the massive sub-base, and eventually finds out that Paige has aimed a warhead at Vandenberg. We quickly have to head over and stop this, re-aiming the warhead at Area 51 itself. We have to head there to stop Paige, who is now trying to join himself with Helios to power himself up and become a being larger than man. Area 51 is the final level of the game. It takes us everywhere over the secret and undercover base. We're attacked by aliens, MJ-12 agents. It's a tour of insanity and hidden conspiracy. Everything is revealed here. At the final stage, we're given a choice. Deus Ex holds three endings behind its final level. We are presented with these three options throughout the level, the powers that be toying with us and pulling us in every direction. Tracer Tong wants us to take down the surveillance system that watches everyone and take the world back into a dark age. This would destroy any sort of control that these organizations have on people, but it would unplug everyone from their universal collective connection. We can also destroy Bob Page and side with Morgan Everett. This will put the Illuminati back in power and leave us at their disposal. This is taking the devil we know over the one we don't, putting us under another thumb, hoping that it's better than the last. The final ending that we can achieve is siding with Helios. We can assimilate with the entity instead of Bob Page. This will turn JC into an all-powerful being, greater than what has come before. Every ending sort of leaves the fate of the world into question. Whether JC would do the right thing with Helios is questionable. He could also be influenced by the AI, causing him to exert worse control than MJ-12. Plunging humanity into a dark age isn't great, but at least they can be free to restart. Though that may just turn into the same cycle that they went through before. Siding with Everett gives another organization control again. We have to hope that they won't make the same mistakes, but we have no idea if they will or not. Any ending is nebulous, but it allows you to make your own assumptions, your own interpretations on what happened, until the sequel, of course, but we'll get there soon enough. If I had to choose one, I would honestly side with Tracer Tong. I think humanity would be better off building small civilizations again, communities. At least they could try again, restart and make a concerted effort to not make the mistakes of the past. They wouldn't be under the thumb or control of anyone. Deus Ex is a true masterpiece in every sense of the word. I'm not saying that it's a perfect game, but I don't think that games have to be perfect 
to be a masterpiece. The gameplay of Deus Ex allows for so much freedom. As the game progresses, areas open up and they're just so interconnected. So many vents, so many ways to approach. We can hack, pick, sneak, kill, explode our way out or in. It just depends on what we want. But this doesn't just reflect freedom. It reflects respect. The developers truly trusted the players to become a part of the experience. When you play Deus Ex, you aren't just playing a game, you're creating it. Given the creative freedom, the game allows you to become a part of its legacy, of its development. The team themselves said they were incredibly surprised with what the players did with things, things they never intended. And in that way, when you play Deus Ex, you become a part of it, assimilated into the Helios AI, one with the machine. The story itself is incredibly prophetic and poignant, one that grows more true as the days go by. A good story ages with the world that it's delivered to, and in that regard, Deus Ex is exactly 22 years old. The themes that it deals with, questioning your own existence, what it means to be alive, what it means to be machine, if it even matters in the first place. The themes of control, surveillance, and what it really means to be free in a modern world. It's all just so honest, and it doesn't hold anything back from its audience. In this way, the team also trusts and respects the player. They know that they can handle complex ideas, interesting thoughts that don't need to be spoon-fed to them. The story doesn't wait for you, it expects you to find it. In that regard, the story becomes even more satisfying when we start to piece things together, finding secrets and revealing the true narrative, if there even is one. Can truth even exist in a world like this? The aesthetic itself lives far past the legacy of the game. It permeates the game itself, pushing through the screen to affect the player and deliver another level of immersion almost indescribable with this language. It's truly something to behold, something special and genuine. The design holds no insecurity whatsoever, no ingenuine points, just truth. This is where Deus Ex really shines, if it could even get any brighter. Deus Ex is truly powerful, something amazing. It's an incredible highlight in the history of video games. It's a monument of the past, but also exists on its own today. It's a massive touchstone, one that we should never, ever stop talking about. Because once this game is forgotten, we truly are as doomed as the world Deus Ex presents. Deus Ex sold pretty well in the United States. It had made about $5 million by the end of the year 2000. In Europe, it was even larger, a massive hit. It dominated the charts and would eventually reach gold status. It only reached 1 million sales by 2009, being outsold by its sequel. The game was also critically acclaimed, receiving high praise by most outfits. Most praised its level of freedom and versatility. The team at Ion Storm was ready to start on the second entry in the series, almost immediately following the release of Deus Ex. Deus Ex Invisible War began development shortly after Deus Ex was released. It was again developed by Ion Storm and published by Eidos Interactive. Some pretty important staff changes were made this time around. The largest was that Warren Spector was no longer directing. Deus Ex was the game of his dreams, and he got the massive opportunity to make that game. He wanted to give that opportunity to someone else, Harvey Smith, the lead designer from the first Deus Ex. Spectre had also just invested a lot into the previous game and wanted to take more of a back seat on this entry. At the time, Ion Storm had also been developing the third Thief game, after Looking Glass Studios had shut down. This left Spectre having a supervising role for both games, rather than being really hands-on with anything. Spectre described himself as the chief kibitzer for Ion Storm, a Yiddish term that means to offer advice, often unwanted. Though Spectre wanted to take a back seat, it was hard for him in the beginning. He questioned many of the choices that were made, but ultimately he felt fine standing back. 
One of the team's big goals with this entry was to get the game into more players' hands. They needed this entry to be profitable, so they wanted to make it more accessible. Spectre knew that this term was looked at as a bad thing by fans, but he didn't view it as a dumbing down, just making something more available. It's kind of ironic because a lot of the decisions that Spectre was questioning during development were things I questioned about the game when I actually played it. When Spectre was asked what he hoped fans took away from the game, he said this. I hope players take away from it that we didn't sell out. Just doing another game with a number after the name for profit because we didn't. I hope they take away that, hey, these guys really paid attention to what happened in the first game, what we said about the first game, what they learned from the first game, and they refined the gameplay to a point that I can't even imagine them making it any better. It's very clear that the team wanted the game to make money, but also wanted more people to play their game. At the same time, they didn't want to be viewed as sellouts or making something that wasn't worthy of the series it was a part of. To this end, they developed the sequel for Xbox as well. This drastically changed the scope, style, and design of the game. Due to the Xbox's limited processing power and RAM, this meant environments had to be sized down. There had to be some changes made, but the team wanted to improve overall. Smith specifically referenced the stealth as something the team tried to upgrade in Invisible War. The team used a heavily modified version of Unreal Engine for the development of the Deus Ex sequel. Deus Ex Invisible War was released on December 2nd, 2003 for Microsoft Windows and Xbox. A few notes before we get into things. I played Deus Ex Invisible War on PC. This was mostly because this version was easily accessible to me. It was much more of an effort to buy an original Xbox, one of the only classic consoles that I don't yet own, and a copy of Deus Ex Invisible War. I thought this was going to be much more of an issue than it actually was. Everything I had read online about Invisible War had told me that it was much more of the same when compared to the previous game. Its PC version was terribly integrated with modern hardware and it barely worked without a ton of fixes. This wasn't exactly the case for me though. Outside of one widescreen fix that I had to run every time I booted up the game, I encountered virtually no issues. I think I saw one crash during my entire playtime, so I got very lucky. This video is also probably going to be shorter than my other ones in the series, mostly because the game itself is shorter, and I also just didn't have a lot to say about it. If you want the quick version, the game just devolves the previous game and takes it down a level. It's not terrible, but isn't great either. Invisible War begins with a cinematic. The intro and ending cutscenes are now pre-rendered for both the PC and console versions of the game. Some people are trying to locate a terrorist who ends up using a nanite detonator to destroy the city of Chicago. At this point, we can clearly see that the style and aesthetic of the series has greatly changed. I wasn't really impressed with this intro, mostly because it's hard to really even understand what's going on. On top of that, this odd sci-fi style is much different than the espionage secrecy one that we got before. There's also a character here voiced by Tom Hall, one of the founders of id Software and Ion Storm. Tom Hall voiced Walton Simmons from Deus Ex and some other characters in the first game. Because his voice was so iconic though, I just assumed the whole game that there was going to be some twist that Simmons was still alive, but it never came. The narrators confirm that they have an invisible weapon that's going to win this invisible war. We don't get very many choices when crafting our character, just their look, the interface color, and the difficulty. This is because Invisible War has removed the skill system from the game. No longer are we allowed to choose our abilities and truly craft our character. Skills and biomods were sort of merged into one system overall. I really don't love this change. It again feels like a regress. It feels like we're given less choice in favor of gaining a larger audience. We also don't play JC Denton in this entry. We play Alex D. Now, I'm just going to spoil it here because I don't really think it's that big of a reveal, but Alex is actually Alex Denton. This was pretty obvious if you played the first game. Alex could actually be found in one of the Area 51 containers. The famous GameSpy interview, the Deus Ex Continuity Bible, even sees the journalist asking the developers who Alex Denton is, and they responded that they couldn't talk about it. 
clearly they had plans for using Alex in the sequel. I don't mind playing another character in this game, it's honestly not a bad choice overall, and lets us tell a new story with someone else. Alex grew up in Chicago, being trained at the Tarsus Academy. This is actually where we start our game, in the middle of a terrorist attack on the city. The game takes place 20 years after the events of Deus Ex in 2072. In the Tarsus facility, we have to be evacuated. Alex is part of a bio-modification program with two other people, Billy Adams and Leo Jankowski. Something clearly fishy is going on, though, and the Order begins attacking the facility. We have to escape, and Adams tells us that she has information on the people behind Tarsus. Apparently, the subjects here were being monitored and experimented on, not trained. We see the ceiling disappear in our room, a false construction that was made specifically for monitoring subjects. We end up escaping the facility and are taken to Seattle. Before we get further into the story, we really should talk about the intricacies of combat in Invisible War. Like I said before, skills have been taken away. Augmentation and skills have been combined into the Biomod system, which is really just the augmentation system from the previous games. Biomods are mostly activated powers that we have to turn on and off, just like augmentations. These mods are activated through their menu and they use bioenergy like before. There are different categories of biomods and we have choices of three in each of them. The only real problem with the biomod system is that upgrades for it are found almost immediately and are way too common. This is a huge problem with this game. The balance of items. We receive items either far too often or very little. We can upgrade all of our augments very quickly and then just see no progression after that. This is mostly because the biomod system is the only system of progression in the game. There's a GameSpy interview with Harvey Smith and Ricardo Baer about Invisible War. They mostly talked about the sequel, but when speaking about the difficulties with the original game, they had talked about balancing skills and reducing the amount of ranks that you could obtain. Eventually, they realized they needed to implement more progression to make winning more rewarding. This is when they introduced mods to weapons, little upgrades that you could achieve throughout the game. Mods are still included in Invisible War, but are far less common, so we're really left with bio mods and weapon mods, two systems that don't really feel like much. The other problem with bio mods is that there are some incredibly OP ones. Deus Ex Invisible War still approaches combat like the previous game, giving you the freedom to do what you'd like. We can stealth or attack head on. The problem with the system, though, is that stealth just really isn't that viable. We can headshot enemies, but they don't die right away, so this inevitably reveals us to the opposing forces. The baton and other melee weapons also don't work like they used to, so no more sneaking up behind guards. The only real option for stealth in the game is using biomods. We can use the cloaking biomods, one for organics and one for synthetics, to just walk through any area undetected. This will literally get us past any situation. We can just walk past tons of enemies, and as long as we don't fire or run out of energy, we're good. The difference between the cloak in Invisible War and the one in Deus Ex was the first game made you choose between cloaking to organics or synthetics. Invisible War doesn't make you do this, so you can cloak yourself from everyone. I really don't like this new system in general. It feels pretty rough and like a huge step back from the first entry. Another massive change is the UI. Clearly, you can see that the UI is a lot different to the one in Deus Ex. The inventory screen has been heavily narrowed down. We have limited slots, clunky notes and quest menus, and the overall design just looks bad. This whole radial menu thing looks awful compared to the simple PC menus we had before. Though, there is a reason for this. Obviously, the team was trying to gain the console market on this sequel, so they had to try and please both. Most of the time when I've seen this, though, it never really goes well, and you end up getting something that doesn't please anyone. The overall gameplay style of Invisible War is the same as Deus Ex. Each level generally sees us trying to infiltrate somewhere, stop an operation, kill or save someone. 
We have a choice of how to go about this, multiple angles of approach. The biggest difference here is with environment design. Most environments have been changed from large open areas that contain facilities and smaller corridors to just the corridor part. Each area is also split up into tons of smaller areas with longer loading screens in between them. This change was obviously made because the console version of the game couldn't support these massive large open environments. It does also feel like the proportions of items are just a bit off as well. Everything feels very large. We're almost like a child with showers and toilets looming above us. Most of the changes that Invisible War makes are for obvious reasons, because the team wanted to make a more profitable game and try something new, while also pushing their game onto consoles. A great idea in theory, but in execution, it seriously cuts some things that were integral to the game in the first place. This is all to say that I don't like these changes that were made, but I also don't think it makes Invisible War bad to play. It still functions pretty well, and the shooting is actually probably better than the first Deus Ex. We no longer have to wait for the reticle to focus in on a target, we can just shoot. For the most part though, I think the gameplay is generally a regression, but the systems that made Deus Ex interesting in the first place are mostly still there. Once we get to Seattle, the game begins to split. We can choose between two paths here, heading to the Order or helping out the WTO. The Order are a new world religion that kind of has eaten all of the other religions of the world. They are led by Her Holiness, a mysterious figure that sees over the organization. You can't really tell what they're for or what they're about because everything they say is pretty vague in general. On the other side is the WTO, or the World Trade Organization. This is a trade syndicate run by Chad Dumier, the head of Silhouette from the first game. Both organizations are particularly shady and seem to have something going on. When you start, though, it kind of seems like the Order is fighting for some freedom from government. It's quite odd, though, that we don't seem to get as much information or context on the world in this entry. Maybe obscuring the past and context were part of an artistic choice to make the world more vague, but I'm not sure. The strange thing about the factions is also that we can switch which faction we're working with at any given point in the game. Each mission will have two objectives, for the most part, one from each side of the conflict. I get what they're doing here, in that they didn't want players to feel locked into one path, but it just feels strange to have the leaders of the factions contact us after every mission and scold us. They usually are angry that we didn't do what they wanted, but they still go, but you know, if you still want to work with us, then you can, just don't do it again, okay? And then we do it again, okay? In Seattle, we can get involved in some war between coffee shops, go to the Greasel Pit, bet on some lizard experiment fights, and get involved in all kinds of side missions and scraps. Through our investigations, we reveal that there is another secret group called the Templars, an organization full of modern-day soldiers that despise biomods. This group is who we are investigating either for the WTO or the Order. One strength that Invisible War did have was it was constantly sending me off on side missions. Venturing through the city and talking to everyone we can will get us distracted pretty easily. We'll eventually have a list full of different things to check out. These aren't always the most interesting quests, some of them can be pretty boring, but there were some highlights throughout the game. It did bring a sliver of that wonder that we came across in the previous entry. We have to go find a new weapon that the Templars are working on called the Magrail. To do this, we have to get a pilot. Getting to the next mission isn't as easy as it used to be in Deus Ex. We don't have a jock this time to help us out. We either have to save someone that will give us a free ride, or pay a pilot that will take us to our next mission. One cool feature of this is your mission start point will be different based on the pilot you chose. One could be more covert, and the other could put you right at the front door. This creates some variety in missions and approach, trying to mirror more of the original game and evolve that formula that it had. We invade the facility and we can actually find a gray alien in here already. I was weary of letting him out of his enclosure because I figured he'd just attack me like aliens in the previous game. I didn't expect him to actually come out and attack the scientists running the lab, but it makes sense. He was communicating to me through telepathy. 
It would make sense that he would attack the ones holding him captive, not the new face that was freeing him. Talking to the project director upstairs, he said that he thinks Mako, the company manufacturing the weapons, are supplying the Templars with hundreds of thousands of weapons. Once we kill the man who developed the Magrel or steal the plans, we can leave heading to Cairo. This is another major hub area for the game where we can get many different missions and objectives. It doesn't seem like there's as much to do here as Seattle though, but that was just my perception. The big deal in Cairo is dealing with Plague 11, the disease that's racking the city. We also encountered the Omar here. The Omar are pretty interesting. They are augmented humans that have had their frontal lobes replaced with a transmitter. Their culture and society surrounds itself with trying to push past the limitations of humanity. They also happen to have a huge black market trade. We can get some black market biomods from them that are harder to achieve than the other options. Turns out some corrupt individuals have been the ones perpetuating the plague in Cairo. We can also find Dr. Nassif here, who gives us some pretty important information. Nassif was the scientist who turned Alex into a lab project. We have the choice to kill her or not, but what she says before we do that is the important part. She tells Alex that he's a clone of J.C. Denton, which, if you were paying attention, you'd already know. Apostle Corps, the company that Nassif is a part of, has one more base in Trier, Germany. Tracer Tong is the one leading that cell. The only man left in the world that can contact JC Denton is him. When we head to Germany, we can immediately talk to Tracer, who tells us about a gateway nearby that we can use to get to JC's secret base in Antarctica. Unfortunately, the ruins nearby that house the portal have already been taken over by the Templars. When we get into the base that holds the portal we need, we find Nicolette Duclair, who also drops some truth bombs on us. Apparently the Illuminati is still around, still ruling from behind the scenes. They are behind both the Order and the WTO, creating the groups so that they could get people warring. Once the organization started fighting, it became easier to control people from the shadows. We have to get an activation key for the portal before we begin to head out. It's located in a nearby Templar stronghold. Once we retrieve this, we make a portal to Antarctica and head out to find JC. When we get to Antarctica, there are a ton of greys just standing around. One of them talks to Alex to tell him that apparently there are multiple keys that will unlock JC from his slumber. The greys have been protecting JC while he rests because they're friends or something. So, Invisible War's story is actually a little bonkers. The beginning half just doesn't really feel like it does anything new. It's a similar character arc. Someone who doesn't understand the world is having the veil being pulled away, and they begin to realize that things are much deeper than they thought. This worked really well in the first game, but it begins to feel like we're retreading old ground here. Once we get towards the end, they start introducing interesting elements, but all of these interesting elements are really just callbacks to the previous game. Tracer Tong, Nicolette Duclair, JC Denton, all of this stuff just feels more like fan service than anything else. I do think some of the stuff, like the aliens, are cool, but they're certainly not good storytelling. We eventually find JC who is conscious but trapped. We have to fix the Helios processing modules. Each of these brings us back into one of JC's memories, which lets us see some environments from the previous game, but in the new engine. I think the sequence is actually pretty cool. There's some interesting concepts here and a short, visually appealing little sequence. We eventually get JC out of this trapped mode. We should also probably talk about the ending to Deus Ex really quickly. So obviously that game had three different endings to choose from. With that choice being made at the end of the game, fans were sort of left to choose their own canon when they beat Deus Ex. This is all thrown out the window when the sequel released, because Invisible War canonizes every ending. The collapse happened, which was part of Tracer Tong's ending, pushing humanity into a new dark age. The Illuminati was still in power, which was part of Morgan Everett's ending to make them the new rulers, and JC is still merged with the Helios AI. This was a really odd choice, but 
one that I actually kind of like. It's a weird subversion and almost a bit of a troll. It's not the best option you could have picked. The best option would be to make a prequel or make a sequel so far off that the ending to the previous game didn't really matter, but it's still kind of interesting because not a lot of games choose to wrap all of the endings into one. JC and Paul's ultimate goal is to create a new civilization. They want to unify humanity into one being, using the Helios AI to bring them together. JC will give us his spiel, and we leave Antarctica. Before we head to Liberty Island to choose our ending for this game, we have to head back to Cairo. We have to infiltrate the city and either save or kill Paul Denton, who is being held in one of the flight bays. Our last mission takes place on Liberty Island itself, back where we started the first game. This is where we decide our ending. If we give JC and Paul the Oculus Protocol and use their machine, then Alex's nanites are distributed to everyone on the planet. The AI is in complete control and humanity is united. We can kill Paul and JC and give the Illuminati the Aquinas Protocol. This will allow the Illuminati to control the world once again. We can give the Templars the Oculus Protocol and kill JC and Paul, which purges humanity of nanites entirely. All modified humans are destroyed, giving the Templars their ideal world. The last ending only occurs if we kill all of the leaders at Liberty Island. This results in Earth turning into a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The Omar are the only ones to survive and take the planet for themselves. These endings are fine, but again, they exhibit the same problems as the story itself. They're just retreads of the endings we had before. The whole game really just feels like an expansion of the last game, but slightly worse. I can't really say I enjoyed Deus Ex Invisible War. I think that in a vacuum, I would have liked this game. I don't think it's a bad game, but I think it got a raw deal of having to follow one of the greatest games of all time. It was given a burden, because looking at Invisible War and directly comparing it to Deus Ex makes it look really rough in comparison. But when you look at it alone, it really isn't that bad. I think that if Invisible War had come out first, and Deus Ex had been released after, then they would have both been impressive. But we can't view the game in a vacuum. Not truly, because it's still a sequel, and we have to compare it to the previous entry at least a little bit. In that regard, it's a downgrade in most ways. The team really treats this as them trying to appeal to more people to make the game more successful, but I think in doing so, they lost a lot of what made the original game great in the first place. Their rationale makes sense. Who wouldn't want to make money with their game? Spectre even states this in one of the interviews that he did. What we want is as many people as humanly possible to experience the kind of gameplay we provide. I mean, anyone who says, yeah, I want a smaller audience, I don't want a lot of people to see my work, go back to Greenwich Village and put on a beret and whatever. But I think there's a line to ride here. Get your game to as many people as you can, while still giving your fans what they liked in the first place. I think that's the largest thing the sequel loses, is one of the things that I praised the first game for. It's soul. That indescribable thing that I tried to put into words when I talked about Deus Ex. It just really wasn't here for Invisible War. It felt like at certain points it would poke through, like I could feel it in the next room. But for the most part, that aesthetic, that feeling, that energy was gone. This feeling was incredibly important to the appeal of Deus Ex, at least for me. When the game feels pretty hollow, then there isn't a lot of intrigue there. Now, that doesn't mean that Deus Ex games have to keep the same style to be good. But when that aesthetic is gone and, on top of that, most of the gameplay and story have been downgraded, it just feels weird. And I'm honestly not claiming that Invisible War is some terrible, awful cash grab. I genuinely don't think that's the case. It seems like the team wanted to make a really good game, something that people would care about. But this is just one of those cases where it went wrong. That happens with games, and it's not pleasing to see when it does occur. Invisible War sold pretty well on release, regardless. It was described as having a respectable debut. By 2011, the game had actually sold more copies than the original. Critics generally liked Invisible War, but it didn't receive the praise that the first entry did. 
Most publications said that it was an original experience and a brilliant RPG. Some elements were criticized though, like the Biomod system. Another game in the series would come along, but it wouldn't arrive for another eight years. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad. Human Revolution had a long history of development. Before we can talk about the game that would become Human Revolution, we need to talk about Deus Ex 3. After Deus Ex Invisible War was released, the climate at Ion Storm wasn't exactly the best. Most people revered their time there, but Jordan Thomas, a designer at Ion Storm, had described it as an outer cult built around specific personalities. The team was moving forward with two projects simultaneously. Deus Ex Insurrection was the first. In the early stages of development, this would be the third game in the Deus Ex series. Many people had different ideas for it, moving it into the future, using the Invisible War engine, and attempting to correct the mistakes made by the previous entry. There were also some ideas thrown around to make the third game based on a foster family, recruiting teammates and stopping each mission back at a home base. Art Min was brought on to lead the project and eventually had final say in what it would be. Min worked for Looking Glass Studios, briefly helping out on System Shock before moving to Valve. His stint there was also brief, before coming to Ion Storm to help out with the release of Invisible War and lead Insurrection. Min eventually settled on a game set in the past, before Deus Ex. The team also wanted to return to the roots of the series and bring it back to Earth a little bit. Before the project could even be realized, though, Ion Storm began to crumble. The studio wasn't making very much money, most of their projects hadn't been profitable, and John Romero had already left. Then Warren Spector left, and shortly after that, Artman himself left. While Insurrection was being developed and abandoned, Jordan Thomas had begun to work on Deus Ex 3, another Deus Ex 3, simultaneously. The game would have been set before Deus Ex as well, and would see you playing the father or original clone of J.C. Denton. The game was to have unique missions based on the way that you played the game, a project with generative storytelling. This would obviously never come to fruition either though, because Ion Storm was shut down before any of this could happen. Eidos had retained the rights to the series, and in 2007, Eidos Montreal was established. Here, they began concept development on what would become the next game in the series, Deus Ex Human Revolution. They wanted to shoot for the stars and go for something ambitious. The team started by playing the first two games in the series and making sure to note what they liked and what they didn't like about the games. It was important to the team that they get this right, especially since they were all new to the series. Square Enix, the company that owned Eidos Montreal, had given them free usage of the Crystal engine, which was developed for the Tomb Raider reboot. The team took tons of inspiration from other games for Human Revolution. Their cover system took from Rainbow Six Vegas, their AI took from Fear, their regenerating health from the Call of Duty games, their inventory system, game economy, and context-sensitive actions from Resident Evil 4, alert system from Metal Gear Solid, and even the organic feel of stealth from Escape from Butcher Bay. The team's biggest value was to maintain what Deus Ex meant at its core. To the team, this meant that every choice had a consequence, both good and bad. The story was written by Mary DeMarle, who had worked on some of the Myst sequels, Dungeon Siege 2, and Splinter Cell Conviction. The story itself was supposed to mirror the tale of Icarus, flying too close to the sun. A large challenge that she faced was creating a defined main character even though the player would choose what they would say or how they would approach situations. DeMauro also had trouble dealing with the conversation boss fights, which were a new addition to the series. Having so many variables and variety in the way that these encounters could be approached meant a lot had to be considered. 
The first teaser trailer for Human Revolution was released on November 26, 2007. The game itself released on PC and consoles on August 23, 2011. A quick note before we get into things. There are two distinct versions of Deus Ex Human Revolution. The first released was the original version of the game. The second was released on October 22nd, 2013. It was called the Director's Cut and changed multiple things. It altered the graphics, removed the yellow filter on the game, rehauled the boss fights, and included many hours of developer commentary as well as a making of video. Most of these things were meant to address things that fans had issues with or the developers themselves meant to change. One of the biggest things that this version of the game does is integrate all of the released DLC into the game. This is just about the only issue that I have with this version of the game, and I'll talk about it when we get there. The issue doesn't really show up until you're just about done with your first playthrough, but it's pretty glaring. You're probably wondering why I didn't play the base version of the game, but that's because the Director's Cut is the only version of the game that's digitally available on storefronts. The base game can only be bought physically, so for all intents and purposes, this is the base version of the game now. I did also run into some frame dropping issues with this version of the game, which is mostly due to the fact that Nixus, the company originally responsible for porting the base game to PC, did not port the director's cut to PC. It's not game breaking, but was very annoying in some areas. It's still definitely the best performing game though in the series so far. Deus Ex Human Revolution starts quite a lot like the first game in the series. We see a shadowy cabal that's controlling information and conspiring against the public. The anonymous individuals are concerned about someone named David Seraph revealing information to the people of the world. Riots and protests have begun against the altering of the human body's abilities. Human Revolution actually takes place in 2027, well before the events of the first Deus Ex. Mechanical augmentation has just become a part of people's daily lives, replacing limbs to push humanity past their normal abilities. Some people don't like this and are putting up a vigorous fight against it. Seraph Industries is set to reveal a new technology tomorrow, and people are worried it's something that will alter humanity even further. This is where we come in. Our new main character is named Adam Jensen, and he works for Seraph as the head of security. Megan Reed is Jensen's significant other, and she's the one that discovered this mystery new tech that's being revealed tomorrow. We head with Megan as we, the player, get our first tour of Seraph Industries. A lot of information is delivered to us here, mostly the type of things going on at the company, the breakthroughs in science and technology that they're making. We also learn more about the characters as well. Megan is more focused on using technology to help people. Teachers, doctors, construction workers, the average person. But that's not really what Seraph does. The company mostly works with the military, dealing in weapons and super soldiers. She tries to convince us, and herself, that this isn't the case, but judging by the advanced super weapons we're being shown, it is. We run into Pritchard on the elevator. He's the head of cybersecurity at Seraph. He and Jensen don't exactly have the greatest relationship, constantly picking at each other due to some sort of security man pissing contest. We meet David Seraph, the man himself, inside of his massive office. Seraph wants to get Hugh Darrow to show up at the hearings tomorrow. Darrow has a good opinion with Congress, and it'll make Seraph look better to the government. Darrow had a huge effect on the world himself, developing the mechanical augmentations that so many use today. He also inspired David to create Seraph Industries. While Adam and David talk, red flashing lights and alarm sirens begin to ring. An environmental malfunction has been detected and it's up to Adam to go check it out. This is where we're actually allowed to play and we're introduced to most of the systems of human revolution. This entry is mostly a massive change to the status quo that we understood for the series, if there ever could even be such a thing. 
Both games that we played previously were very similar at their core, but as soon as you branched out from the hot magma, you found a crust that was incredibly different. Human Revolution is the same. The things that we know and love about the series are still here. We approach missions and combat situations in generally whatever way we want, or whatever way we can at the time. If we want to sneak, then we take paths over roofs and through vents to maneuver our way to our objective, become the epitome of stealth and the image of the shadows. But if we don't want to waste time and we'd like to take everyone out with us, then we can blast indoors, toss grenades, blow people up, shoot heads, and become the epitome of chaos, the image of the sun. Of course, as per usual, the crux of Deus Ex is still here. It isn't just about these two approaches, it's about whatever you want it to be, or what you need it to be at the time. Maybe you're out of ammo for your silenced weapons, and there's too many enemies to take out effectively. And maybe you get spotted really quick. Well, your stealth level just turned into open firearm combat. If these things are all the same, then what does Human Revolution introduce that's new? Well, one of the biggest changes is this game's cover system. Like I said before, the team took a lot of inspiration from Rainbow Six Vegas for their cover system. Looking at the two games, they function pretty similar when it comes to hiding behind objects. We can hold the right mouse button down for those on PC and go into third person mode to take refuge behind a pillar, wall, or any other sporadically placed piece of equipment. Here we can blind fire, pop up to aim, jump to another piece of cover, or slide along it. For the most part, the system works pretty well and even introduces a new level of gameplay. Getting good at quickly popping out of cover to bang a headshot with your pistol before popping back down takes time. Using the cover system to get more information on where your enemies are at before heading through a stealth section is also a new level of depth that's been added. It may seem like these things are small, but once cover becomes an integral part of your playthrough, you realize that it's not so tiny after all. Design also has to be catered to this element. You can't just ignore it, place the same objects or style environments the same when the player has the ability to see in third person from cover. It's a great new dimension to the game that slightly modernizes it without taking out the feel that the original gameplay loop had. The other big change that Human Revolution makes lies in its augmentation system. Augmentations have been completely overhauled and are much more different to either of the entries that we played before. Now we don't have to choose between any aug, we can have them all if we'd like. The new system is a pretty basic level up system. We get experience for defeating enemies, completing missions, discovering hidden parts of maps or the world, and other various tasks. This XP will eventually give us a Praxis point that we can use to unlock a new ability or access new parts of already unlocked abilities. This reflects the more modern skill tree systems that we're used to seeing. The sheer variety that this system holds, though, is fantastic. We can get abilities that let us break our fall, we can see through walls, we can get better readouts on enemy movements to help with stealth, we can take less damage from bullets, jump higher, take out more targets from stealth. There's a lot here, and it feels great that a lot of these have become passives. I didn't mind the crazy chaotic nature of the augments in the original Deus Ex. Having to turn them on and off and manage power was pretty great, mostly because we could combine a lot of augments and do some wild stuff with it. Here, most everything is passive and has been turned down a notch. We can't do anything ridiculous like auto-healing forever through all damage, but with so many different augments, we get a lot of different ways to go about our missions. This level of variety makes it feel like no two playthroughs will be the same, like my game was made for me and yours for you. A special tailored product to the individual rather than a shared experience. This does bring one downside though, in that Human Revolution slightly feels like we're working more within the bounds of a simulation. It does feel like we're playing a video game, and it doesn't give us many ways to break that. Of course, there are things here that we can do that we weren't supposed to, but the first game felt more like the walls that kept us in place were mere centimeters thick rather than inches. A small difference, but one that should be noted considering the modernization of the series moving forward. 
I don't think this is necessarily a fault either, just better technology and more rigid game design. Hacking has been adjusted quite a bit now as well, where before it was a simple button press with a timer, it's now a whole mini game of its own. We have to control specific nodes to carve out a path to a central node that will complete the hack. This will allow us to access the key code panel, security control, or personal computer we're trying to force our way into. Along the way, we can hack special nodes that will give us extra rewards. We can also fortify nodes to strengthen them against the approaching defense system that will inevitably get called against us once we're seen. With every ability used on a node, we have a chance to be seen by the system. This will begin a countdown, and if we don't complete the hack before the countdown is done, we're kicked out. There's really not a lot of consequence here, though, because if we fail, we're just locked out for 30 seconds and we get to try again. It's kind of odd that there's such little consequence. Making us wait seems like it's more of a real-world reason to not lose rather than an in-game one. Physically punishing the player rather than both the avatar and the one controlling it. I don't mind the hacking overall, and it's probably a better alternative to just pressing a button and waiting for the operation to complete, but boy do we have to do it a lot. There are tons and tons of computers in this game, ones that just have emails we can access either for flavor text or valuable codes that we might need later. We'll also be hacking safes to get more provisions, panels to get us into doors, security computers to turn off turrets and switch robots against the enemy. Most of these things have real codes that we can find to activate the systems anyways, but the availability and ease of hacking kind of de-incentivizes us from actively seeking these codes out. Also, hacking is pretty simple. It doesn't take very many levels before we're powerful enough in hacking to not really worry about it very much. In the beginning of the game, it seems like more of a decision we should make. To hack or not to hack is only the question for a brief period, before it becomes how long is this hack going to take me and how many nuke viruses am I going to use. It's a decent system, but it doesn't seem to fit in with the theme of wanting players to choose their approach. It seems a lot more like the game wants to choose the approach for us. There's also some smaller alterations, like stealth takedowns actually having an animation and system behind them, rather than us just hitting guys in the ass with a baton. But if you haven't noticed yet, this is clearly the highest fidelity Deus Ex we've received. Obviously, it would be. It came out nearly 11 years after the first game in the series. The game looks great graphically, though it's a bit outdated by today's standards. There is quite a bit of change aesthetically. The game has this sort of yellow-gold futurist sci-fi vibe. It's not exactly that close to what we normally expect from something cyberpunk, but being a prequel to the original series, I enjoy the fact that the newer games decided to branch out and create their own specific brand, rather than try and copy the games that came before them. It also flows better with the story of the games. It makes us feel like we're in a new era, that the deus ex that we've seen before is in the future and is a veritable dark age, whereas now there are at least things to have and hold on to. This is a time before governments have explicitly created viruses and spread them out across the population en masse right in the open. This is a time when secret organizations were still operating in secret and trying to move from the shadows. There are some deus ex purists who weren't too fond of this style change, and I can definitely see where they're coming from. I mean, I gushed about the aesthetic of the first game for quite a while in my video. It's this wonderful neo-punk kind of thing that really can't be named. It feels very genuine and honest, but truth be told, I don't know if I'd really like the idea of anyone trying to recreate that. That's not what Human Revolution tried to do. It tried to go in its own direction, aesthetically, stylistically, and thematically, while retaining the core tenets that made Deus Ex, Deus Ex. Back in the beginning section of the game, Jensen realizes that something is afoot when he sees people raiding Seraph Industries. He makes his way through the building, but eventually he's attacked by some mechanically augmented mercenaries, and Megan is kidnapped. 
It seems like Jensen is killed, but after an opening cutscene, it's revealed that Seraph saved him. Six months have passed, and Jensen has been brought back to life through the miracle of some heavy mechanical augmentations. Adam didn't exactly agree to this, but it was in his employment contract that Seraph was allowed to take these kinds of actions. We'll talk about this more in a bit because it's a large part of Jensen's character and one of my favorite themes of the game. Jensen has to have his augments calibrated with Pritchard before heading out on another mission after immediately returning to work. There's already been another attack on Seraph Manufacturing, and we have to go save some hostages. Our main objective, though, is to secure the Typhoon Explosive System, the one we saw being used in the introduction to the game. The terrorists at the plant are looking to try and take it for their own use. This is our first real mission of the game, one where we can choose our path through the environments laid out for us. One thing that Human Revolution brings back from the original Deus Ex is that feeling of exploration and a sort of larger-than-life space that we're maneuvering through. When given an objective, we might feel like we're pressed for time to save hostages, to disable equipment, or to stop the bad guys, so we might do a little exploring. But on first pass, we most likely won't search every nook and cranny. This can leave you feeling like there are hundreds of little areas left to explore, things we missed everywhere, special routes that we could have taken if we went in loud or if we went in quiet. We already talked about the fact that Human Revolution has a lot of variety, which holds true to the series, but Human Revolution also has the feeling and appearance of variety, which is almost as important as variety itself. Sometimes the illusion is more impressive than the actors on the stage. Our secondary objective in the plant is to rescue some hostages. One thing to point out here is that if we take too long exploring the headquarters in the previous section, the hostages will be dead before we even start this mission. We have 15 minutes, but the game doesn't really tell us this. It's an interesting piece of the game because it just happens and we have to deal with it, either missing this content and getting it on a replay or not even knowing we could miss it. The group that has attacked the plant is called Purity First. They're an anti-augmentation group. They claim that augments will cause people to do terrible things, that they are not human. When Jensen finds the Typhoon weapon, a hacker is trying to steal the blueprints. This hacker takes his own life seemingly against his will. When we confront the leader of Purity First, Zeke Sanders, we get our first conversation boss battle. These battles are a fantastic new addition to the game, and there's two types that I consider battles in the game. The first is a simple choice system. Here we can choose how to respond to prompts, and based on our choices, we'll get one of multiple endings to a conversation. Here we can let Z go, subdue him, or kill him. Some of these will see his hostage living, and some will see her dying. The more complicated version of these battles are the persuasion conversations. Here we can see a persuasion meter that will show us how close we are to swaying the person to our side. Either friend or foe, the other individual will have personality ratings that can determine how we should deal with them. We can also get an augment to help us out here. This aug will analyze their personality and give us hints on how to respond. I really like this whole system because I genuinely felt pressured when responding to people but also it held weight. It actually mattered. The more time I took to respond and choose words that actually did what I wanted them to, the more results I saw. When I chose wantonly, I would see the consequences. The system doesn't feel like wandering in the dark, grasping at straws. It genuinely feels like if you focus enough and pay attention to the conversation, the right response will present itself. It isn't easy, but it isn't so unfair that it feels random. Zeke eventually reveals that he didn't know the hacker. It wasn't one of his people. This leads Jensen to think that Zeke was being manipulated into raiding the facility for someone else's needs. When we head back to headquarters, we turn in the Typhoon system to Pritchard, but he's scanning Seraph's network for breaks in the system. Purity first hacked in somehow, and he needs to figure out where. We talk to Seraph in his office, who tells us that the Detroit police are holding the hacker's body at the station. Seraph is one of my favorite characters in the game. 
This is mostly because of the emotion that the performance and writing pull out of the player, or at least me. From the beginning of the game, we play a character that is constantly fucking up. We failed in the first attack on Seraph Industries, the second attack didn't go great, the hacker died, and in my playthrough, I let Zeke go. Seraph isn't really happy with our performance, and he constantly voices this. But Stephen Shellen, the actor that plays Seraph, doesn't deliver this performance in a power figure, angry, and wanting results sort of way. His performance has much more depth. Just through his line delivery and dialogue, we can feel that he's disappointed, but that he wants more from Adam. Yeah, about Sanders. What the hell were you thinking? Letting him slip away like that? I sent you in there to take care of things. He doesn't want to be mean to Adam. He doesn't want to yell at him. This representation of a disappointed boss works so incredibly well and just feels so genuine. You almost feel bad for disappointing him. Couple this with the fact that we're playing a Deus Ex game where we kind of just assume that Seraph is going to turn into a bad guy at some point, and you have a character with intense focus and many layers to be deconstructed throughout the course of the story. Getting back into our office for the first time, we are given our first side mission or secondary objective. There are plenty of these throughout the course of the game. They're an evolution of the secondary objectives from previous entries. These now function more like traditional side quests that we'd see in modern games. For the most part, this optional content is really good, usually pretty lengthy missions with a decent amount of variety and choice of approach. Some of the missions also hold quite a bit of information about our story or characters in general. Skipping these means missing out on either interesting scenarios crafted by the team or really important information. For example, the first mission we receive is Lesser Evils. We talk to Tim Carella, who works at Seraph Industries. He's been helping steal neuropazine from the business with Brian Tyndall. Carella wants out, but Tyndall is blackmailing him with security cam footage. We find Tyndall's apartment, which is promptly attacked by a junkie looking for neuropazine. When we find Tyndall, he tells us that he was distributing the drug to people who needed it. Neuropazine is a drug that augmented individuals use to prevent their system from rejecting the mechanics. Tyndall was giving the drug to people who were forcibly augmented, something that Jensen already has experience with. We can help out Tyndall by taking out some dealers that he's in deep with, or we can just kill him. Either way, we can get the footage back and help out Corella in the end. This mission does multiple things for the game and the story, though. It contextualizes the world around us. The neuropazine epidemic paints a bleak picture of the world, of people forced into augmentation and then swung into an addiction that they can't control. These dealers, at least the ones we know, are just trying to help, but the only way that they can help is enabling an addiction that was forcibly pressed onto someone else. On top of that, Jensen has also been forcibly augmented. He never wanted this, and it comes up quite often in our dialogue choices. Jensen can express some great distaste for being forcibly augmented. Another side quest called Motherly Ties deals with Megan Reed's mother wanting closure on her death. She thinks that the attack on Seraph Industries was more nefarious than the official reports say. We have to seek out Megan's autopsy reports and other information regarding her death. We eventually realize that there was a cover-up and something fishy is going on. Megan's death is a huge part of Jensen's character and even has a huge part in the beginning of the game. Both of these side quests can be missed entirely. We don't have to do them, and they aren't the biggest part of the story, but they're incredibly interesting pieces of content that aren't just filler. They feel like half pieces of the story. We don't need them to understand what's happening, but if we want more, it's available to us. The only real complaint I have about the side content is probably a complaint with the entire quest system overall. In the first two games, it was up to us to figure out how to complete quests and objectives in the game. This obviously incentivizes exploration and out-of-the-box solutions to solve the problems at hand. This goes hand-in-hand -hand with the rest of the game and its general theme of player choice, the bounds of the simulation not really existing. 
In human revolution, we have big, fat waypoints on the screen that tell us where to go constantly. It doesn't really work within the world of the game, and it also doesn't really work for staying true to this immersive sim that we are playing. It's something that can be turned off in the menus, but when criticizing the default game, it's something that needs to be talked about. In the main story, we have to head to the police station to try and get access to the body of the hacker from the attack. Here, we can convince one of the guards to let us into the morgue. He used to be on the SWAT team with Jensen before the two of them encountered an augmented teenager, and Jensen refused to kill him, so Wayne Haas did it. Jensen was relieved from the force, and Haas took his spot. He's been dealing with the PTSD from this ever since. Jensen's backstory is slowly revealed over the course of the game. It isn't something that we see overtly talked about, just small references made in documents, emails, and conversations with others. It's something we can piece together ourselves. It gives the world and our character a sense of realism. We don't have people constantly spitting things about our character's past, only when it's appropriate. We find out that the neural hub of the hacker is a very important piece of information to the U.S. government. It's been given ultraviolet classification, meaning no one is to look at the contents. We can also find information on the cover-ups into both attacks on Seraph's facilities, all spearheaded by a man named Joseph Manderley, who you'll recognize if you've played the first game. We have to take the neural hub to Jensen's apartment. Here, Pritchard analyzes the equipment and finds out that it was designed to turn a human into a proxy. This means that someone was hacking the blueprints through Yune, not Yune themselves. They were being controlled by another individual who hid their tracks. Pritchard figures out that the hole in Seraph's cybersecurity is coming from a signal in Derelict Row. There's a transmitter that's been keeping a back door open for a while now. While we're here, we can take a look at Jensen's apartment. It's another incredibly interesting display of environmental storytelling, albeit slightly more overt than what we saw in Deus Ex. Jensen's character seems to display more similar qualities to someone like Paul Denton rather than JC. He's smashed his mirror in multiple times, seemingly not used to or wanting these augmentations that he's received. His apartment is a mess covered in guns, schematics, and equipment. He has a hidden panel behind a wall that he can access for lots of extra equipment. Infiltrating the facility, we find out that it was used by the Tyrants, an organization that attacked Seraph Industries. It was also used by the hacker that was trying to access the Typhoon. The Tyrants, the three augmented individuals that attacked Adam and Megan six months ago, are here. We have to fight off Barrett in our first boss battle of the game. These were a highly contentious part of the game when it was released. People really didn't enjoy them as there weren't ways to approach these fights from a stealth aspect. These boss battles were actually outsourced to another developer called Grip Entertainment. The boss battles were changed in the director's cut version of the game to have more options for all playstyles. I don't really mind the boss battles that much. It's not a large change from the previous games. The first game had boss battles, they just weren't as segmented as the sections in this game are. Barrett is pretty easy to take down, and once we do, he tries to take us with him. He does tell us that we need to go to Hangsha, China to find out what we're looking for. When we get back to the headquarters, Pritchard tells us that the back door in the firewall was set up by Seraph himself. He was streaming information through it quite a bit before Jensen was hired. Seraph tells us that he had an investigator look into Jensen's past. Apparently, he was a product of genetic modification at a lab called White Helix. Eventually, he gives us a passport so that we can head to China. Human Revolution's story is pretty good for the most part. It definitely takes a different fork in the road from the previous entries. If Invisible War went the other direction in terms of sci-fi and high-tech aesthetics, and Deus Ex was somewhere in the middle, Human Revolution is on the other end of the ground. I do think that it's good and was most likely the best choice for the developer to give this new leg of the series its own style. But one of the things that I like the least is that most of the conspiracy stuff has been removed from the game entirely. 
In the first game, we would often hear real conspiracy theories name-dropped constantly. The Bilderbergs, the Trilateral Commission, Area 51, the Rothschilds. It was steeped in the real world, which made Deus Ex in itself feel real. Human Revolution removes most of this. There are sparse references to these things through a radio host named Lazarus. This radio host is mostly played as a parody, though, to modern-day entertainers who ramble and shout about frogs, demon politicians, and other things that I can't say or YouTube will demonetize me. This reduces that real-life conspiracy influence to sort of a joke, though, which I think ignores a large part of the deus ex aesthetic that made the game special. Its roots in the real world made the game more tangible, like you could feel it run through your fingers. Removing this and essentially turning it into a joke that references real-world people is kind of odd. There's also the fact that a lot of this comes true in Deus Ex, so essentially this guy was a real legitimate doomsayer that was just mostly being ignored. When we get to Hangzhou, we have to infiltrate the apartment building that was home to Windmill, the hacker that was controlling the other hacker that we saw die. He's not here though, and Bell Tower Associates, a private military company, has already beat us there. We can head to a local nightclub called The Hive and look for the owner, a man named Tong Si Hung. After doing some convincing, he eventually tells us that Bruggen is in the Alice Garden pods. Bruggen tells us he was hired by Zhao Yun Ru, the CEO of Taiyang Medical. Zhao got Bruggen to participate in the attack on Seraph Industries. Bruggen wants us to clear his name as Zhao is trying to have him killed since he's a loose end. He wants us to get into Tai Young Medical and get the security footage that's been used to blackmail him. He gives us a keycard and bell tower guards storm the place. Inside Tai Young, we find out that the attack on Seraph was only initiated to try and kidnap Megan and her team. When we confront Zhao, she manipulates Adam into thinking that she's being controlled and gets away. The security footage we found before implicates Eliza Kassan, a news anchor for Picus Communications. When we arrive at Picus, everyone is gone except for Eliza. We realize quickly it's a trap and the building is stormed. We can make our way through the facility and find Eliza, who is actually an artificial intelligence that controls media and information. She tries to give us more info, but she's being controlled by one of the tyrants, Yelena Fedorova. We have another boss battle, a particularly annoying one. We defeat the woman and Eliza gives us a new lead, Isaias Sandoval. He was supposed to disable the scientists' GPL trackers so it would seem like they were dead. When we get back to Detroit, people are rioting in the streets. They're protesting the tech that allows humans to be enhanced. We meet Seraph in Jensen's apartment who tells us to head to the Detroit Convention Center. There, William Taggart is giving a speech. Taggart is an activist who is very anti-augmentation. His right-hand man happens to be Sandoval. We have to convince Taggart to give us Sandoval's location or take it from him. Eventually, we track down Sandoval, who's hiding out underground. He realizes that Taggart has thrown him under the bus, placing the blame on him for the riots. He decides to take his own life, which we can talk him down from. He eventually tells us that the scientists still have their implants, but their frequencies were just changed. Hugh Darrow is back at Seraph HQ. He talks about multiple things quickly, including augmentation regulation and a project called Panchea, meant to help curb global warming. Seraph tells us that Sevchenko, one of the captured scientists, has been tracked to Hengsha, so we head back to China. As we arrive back in, though, our ship is shot down, and Malik is killed in the process. Bell Tower is hunting down Jensen at this point. We also have to head over to Lim to have our biochip replaced, as there's a new malfunction causing them to glitch out. When we track down the signal, we find it at the hideout of the Harvesters, a gang that captures people and takes out their augs. They either sell these or use them for themselves. We find Tong with Sevchenko's arm. He said that the body was sold to them by Bell Tower. We have to track down Tong's son, who happens to be Tracer Tong, the very same one that would be instrumental in the events of Deus Ex and Invisible War. Tong gives us a bomb to blow up Bell Tower's ships. After doing this, we should be able to get in a pod and escape. 
Now, this is just about the end of the game, or rather, very close to the end. We only have a couple more missions before the finale, but the director's cut changes this. The one story DLC that was released for Human Revolution is inserted here. In the original game, it would jump ahead three days, Jensen having been missing during that time. The DLC patches this hole, and the director's cut makes this DLC mandatory. Now, extra content is normally a good thing when we can choose to experience it, but we can't with The Missing Link. We're forced to play it, and this wouldn't be bad if it didn't entirely mess up the pacing of the game's narrative. The DLC itself really isn't that bad and has its own interesting themes and characters. There's some nice twists and turns here as well as some interesting areas, but placing it right before the finale of the game just slows everything down. The DLC really does feel like an isolated incident, but trailing off on this incident for a few hours and then getting back to the finale of the game is kind of ridiculous. During the DLC, Jensen wakes up on a ship, captured by Natanya Keitner. She thinks Jensen is a spy and is torturing him. We quickly find out that she's actually a double agent. She wants Adam to help her find evidence to incriminate Bell Tower. A man named Burke seems to be running the place, forcing scientists to do hidden research. Gary Savage happens to be one of those scientists, a man we would meet as J.C. Denton in the first Deus Ex game. Eventually, Kavanaugh decides to turn whistleblower. Keitner gets killed, and we have a decision to make. We can save Kavanaugh so that she can present evidence and maybe take down Bell Tower, or save the prisoners being held there. This is obviously quite the moral dilemma, a classic example of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. You can also just destroy the gas dispenser nearby, though, and save both of them. We eventually fight Burke and we're taken back to our sleep pod by a man named Quinn, a powerful secret agent working for someone named Janice. One of the absolute worst things about this DLC is that it gives us access to this big ship that we have to travel back and forth across. The only thing stopping us from doing this easily is that there are checkpoints all over it that we constantly have to stop into to be scanned for security. These serve as sort of loading screens, but they're so long and constant. It's incredibly annoying and makes everything take even longer. Once we're done with that detour, we can continue with the main story. We arrive in Singapore at Omega Ranch, a research facility. We have to find the three scientists here and piece together some information. The first thing we can do is create a distraction, using the scientists to try and get further into the facility and find Megan. We can also find out that the Illuminati have been working on a kill switch, activating all of the biochips for augmented people so that they can be controlled. Zhao does this to us when we confront her, and we have to fight Namir, the third boss battle. Now, obviously, if we didn't take the biochip replacement earlier, then we won't be able to be controlled here, and we can fight with a clear, distractionless UI. We find Megan, who was still alive. She tells Adam that Omega Ranch is owned by Hugh Darrow. On top of that, she's been working with Darrow in a classic, it's not as simple as you think scenario. Megan stole Adam's DNA, which her research is completely based on. We then see Darrow giving a press conference where he activates everyone's new biochips to turn them into aggressive zombies. We have one final mission, heading to Panchea, the massive geoengineering facility. Darrow has completely turned. He originally created augments to help the less fortunate. Now he realizes that his creation is being used to control the populace. He can't have that anymore, and that's why he decided to set off the receiver. He figures if the regulators realize what a Achilles tendon the augments are, they'll be banned for good. On our way to the core of the facility, we can meet Taggart and Seraph. This mirrors the first Deus Ex game, both people giving us a sort of path to follow when we have to inevitably pick our ending. At the core, we encounter Zhao. She merges with Hyron, a massive supercomputer. It's the most advanced computer system in the entire world. Before we talk about the ending, I do want to talk about the incredible and interesting aesthetic of Human Revolution. The design and art style that was chosen for this game can be just 
beautiful at certain points. It isn't always served by the tech of the game itself, but it's a really interesting design overall. Vermeer and Rembrandt were quoted as being references for the color scheme for the game. The entire visual style was based on Renaissance artwork in general. The black and gold designs play yin and yang for each other, black representing the modern dystopia we find ourselves in, and the gold representing humanity's hope for the future. It's clear that the art team had a very distinct vision for what they wanted the game to look like. Not only that, but they wanted to tell the game's story visually, not only through the scenes of the game, but the environments, colors, textures, and backgrounds. This is even reflected in the trailer for the game that mirrors Renaissance paintings and the Icarus myth itself. Even Adam Jensen sitting on this chair smoking a cigarette is posed just like a classic portrait. You'll also notice that characters who support augmentation are generally dressed in outfits that are reminiscent of the classic Italian style, and characters who oppose augmentations generally dress in modern plain clothes. The final boss battle of the game pits us against Hyron, who was being merged with Zhao. At the broadcast center for the signal, we're contacted by Eliza. She tells us that we have multiple options for a choice here. We have four different options. We can broadcast Darrow's signal, confessing about Augs and the Illuminati. This will cause augmentation to be permanently banned. We can blame Humanity Front for the attack, which will cause augments to be further developed. We can blame the events on tainted neuropazine, which will cause augmentations to have tight regulations moving forward. Or we can destroy the facility and let humanity choose the truth for themselves. There are slight variations on each of these endings as well. This is determined by how we chose to play the game, whether we were more violent or more passive throughout the course of our playthrough. The post credit scene shows Bob Page talking to Morgan Everett about Morpheus, the AI that we found in the first game. Megan Reed is revealed to be working for Paige on a virus. It's also hinted that Jensen's DNA will be used to begin the project that will create the Dentons, that he is the precursor to everything. I do enjoy the story overall for Human Revolution. Its themes are incredibly interesting. Obviously, the game is fueled by the idea of transhumanism. Are these mechanical augmentations ethical? Should humans stay pure and not accept any sort of mechanical alterings to our human form? You could even make the argument that we are already augmented, that phones and computers are just augments for our brain. Sure, they're slow, but since most knowledge is available through the clicks of some keys, there's surely something to be said about it. The morality of forced augmentations is also explored quite a bit in the game as well. This is a future that I could completely see happening. People forced into getting different augmentations for their careers or just their lives. This is another parallel to the modern day with things like cell phones. You can't exist in the world today without a phone or a computer. It's just not possible, at least not well. This is a sort of societal pressure, forcing technology on the masses. The same would be true for things like augmentations, and this would become an especially complicated conversation when things like neuropazine get involved. We also have the underlying themes of information control. The AI that controls the Picus News Network exemplifies this. It controls information and redirects the thoughts of the public. On top of that, at the end of the game, we're given the choice to obscure the truth from the public. Our first reaction to changing the public's opinion on something through lies might be that it's an awful thing to do, but based on your decision, your opinion on this could change once it's presented with your choices for an ending. The game does this pretty well in most cases, present you with difficult and complicated, nuanced topics in a black and white manner, and then present them in a way that forces you to look at the gray. This again exemplifies the things that Deus Ex tried to do all those years ago. There are some downsides to the story, like the ending itself. There's some variety here in the presentation, like the morality endings, but it's not really that much different. It's really just four endings with some slightly different dialogue. There's also the fact that we choose the ending by pressing one of four buttons. 
The endings we get after pressing these buttons are just really odd, mostly real life footage as well, which just seems like a really weird stylistic choice at the end of the game, especially when Deus Ex's world is so incredibly stylized itself, putting real life footage of our world into the game to illustrate what happens to their world doesn't really seem to fit. Deus Ex Human Revolution is a straightening of the track for the series. It puts these games back on the path that they were meant to be on, making interesting games that are fun to play, that put player choice at the forefront, all while giving us interesting moral and ethical dilemmas to think about. Playing Human Revolution surely does feel like a modernized version of Deus Ex. Sure, there are some downsides to this, mostly because it's a modernized version of Deus Ex. It definitely doesn't feel as cool, gonzo, soulful, or interesting as the first game in the series. There's been something sapped out of this product with a turkey baster, but in my opinion, Deus Ex is one of the best games ever, and you can't exactly directly compare every game to the best game ever. I also think that aesthetics could be a matter of preference. Human Revolution could be a game full of soul to someone, just not me. In the end, when playing it, this game does feel like it holds true to the core values of the series, though. We're given choices and variety when approaching situations. We're allowed to take on enemies and missions the way that we want. We're once again back to a place where each experience with the game can come out feeling truly our own. On top of that, we're back to a situation where the game feels like we can do some fun things with it. We can experiment, we can try stuff out, we can at least attempt to get out of that simulation. The story itself is, again, incredibly interesting. The themes presented get your mind rushing with interesting thoughts. A good story will make you want to argue your own opinion on it. Sure, the endings themselves are pretty tacked on, but that only makes up a small percentage of the story that this game tells. But I have to be honest, a bad ending can make a journey feel quite pointless. With a good ending, this game could have had a story that was truly something great. The new visual style and direction that the series takes overall is incredibly interesting. It sure is a massive step up from Invisible War. That game felt like a downgrade in most ways, and this game surely feels like an upgrade in most ways. Human Revolution was a critical success. The game had fantastic reviews from most outlets. Most praised the visuals and the story itself. Most also criticized the boss battles and level design repetition towards the end of the game. The game sold very well too. By November 2011, it had sold 2.18 million copies in North America and Europe alone. Most of the sales for the game were on Xbox 360. Square Enix would post triple its expected profits from April to September, making the release a favorable result. Originally, a sequel to Human Revolution wasn't planned, but with the success of the game, the studio knew that they had to make one. The team behind Deus Ex Human Revolution originally had no plans for making a sequel, but when the game was incredibly successful, they knew they had to make another entry. Obsidian was actually originally in talks to develop the sequel to Human Revolution, but because of budgetary constraints, the game had to be developed internally. The development began almost immediately after the Missing Link DLC for Human Revolution was finished. The general goal with Mankind Divided was to keep the things that worked and remove the things that didn't. This was easier said than done though, as this goal ended up taking five years to complete. The extended production of the game was chalked up to the upgraded tech that was implemented and the narrative detail. Speaking of narrative, Mary DeMarle had returned to write the scenario for the next Deus Ex game. 
The team really wanted to explore the aftermath and impact of the Og incident at the end of Human Revolution. This is how Mankind Divided refers to Darrow's mind-controlling augmented folks and turning them into raving beasts. The team was also focused on the ending of the game. They wanted it to be more fluid so that players couldn't just make multiple saves to see all the endings. The general theme of the game was to try and evolve past transhumanism. This next logical step for the team was the division of humanity with the existence of augmentations. The fact that these themes aligned with real-world issues was sort of a coincidence, according to the developers. Mankind Divided was meant to be focused in the city of Prague. The team wanted to move across the sea to Europe, since the last game had mostly focused on the U.S., Using Prague also allowed the team to further juxtapose the modern era tech with the classical architecture and design of the past. Adam Jensen obviously returned for the next entry in the series, the first main character to return as a main character in Deus Ex history. Damarl had originally planned for Jensen to die in Human Revolution, as one of her early drafts of the script saw him perish. The team wanted to bring him back, though, because they liked his character and thought that more could be done with him. The director of Mankind Divided, Jean-Francois Dugas, said that the first game was about establishing a base for this new Deus Ex style, and this game was about expanding upon that and taking the series to the next level. The environments were designed to be much more immersive and give players many options of traversal and approach. The team also wanted the environments to be as realistic and detailed as possible. The AI system was also upgraded to respond to players' actions much better. The entire game was run on the Dawn engine, which was built off of the Glacier 2 engine. This one was originally developed by IO Interactive, the studio responsible for the Hitman series. The team again looked to Renaissance artists for inspiration on the art side of things. This time around, they decided to use more blues and grays rather than the golds and blacks of Human Revolution. The team took time designing the aesthetics of all of their environments, and Gollum City itself was specifically based on Kowloon Walled City, a complex in Hong Kong that is incredibly interesting. Michael McCann returned to compose the soundtrack for Mankind Divided. The goal with this OST was to try and communicate the darker themes of the game. McCann wasn't the only person involved with the music, though. Sasha Dekishian, who worked on Borderlands and Tron Evolution, also assisted with the soundtrack. The ending theme itself was composed by Misha Mansour of the prog rock band Periphery. Deus Ex Mankind Divided was announced in April of 2015, after multiple days of a strange ARG slash promotional event called Can't Kill Progress. This was a live stream of a man in an interrogation room, and people watching could choose what the man did or said. The trailer was eventually released, and the game was originally planned for February 23rd, 2016. The game was delayed about four months, which happened to coincide with the five-year anniversary of Deus Ex Human Revolution. Deus Ex Mankind Divided would release on August 23rd, 2016 for PlayStation 4, Windows, and Xbox One. Deus Ex Mankind Divided begins with a voiceover from Jensen. We're back in the shoes of Adam as he begins another mission, but for a new organization. He's working for TF-29, an anti-terrorist task force. But the first thing that we notice here is there's something different about Jensen. He's accepted his augmentations. He's even become sort of cold and aggressive. This will be the setup for his major character change in this game, and the new arc that he's about to go through. For now, the team's mission is in Dubai. They're looking for an arms dealer named Shepard. Their undercover agent, Singh, is going to meet Shepard today at the Desert Jewel Resort Hotel, an unfinished and abandoned building. 
we are supposed to block access to the atrium, separating the two groups. We have a choice of how we'd like to approach, just like in Human Revolution, lethal or non-lethal. We drop in and we get to complete our first mission of Mankind Divided. Before we really get into things, we should probably talk about how Mankind Divided plays. Now, you'll be happy to hear that Mankind Divided has the same goal that's been core to the Deus Ex series this whole time, allowing players to approach situations in the way they choose, giving players the freedom to decide how they want to go about missions, whether they want to kill everyone in sight, take a stealthy approach with no deaths on their hands, or some gray in between all that. Mankind Divided very much has this in mind, and with its incredibly detailed level design, it might be the peak example of it in the entire series. The game just allows for so much exploration and choice. There were so many points throughout my playthrough where I had similar feelings to Human Revolution. I would find a path that would branch off at multiple points, making decisions at each. By the time I had reached the end of the path, there were multiple forks in the road at my back. These forks made tick marks in my brain so that when I've beaten the game, I can realize how many different things there are to find on subsequent playthroughs. The measure of a good immersive sim is that these tick marks number in the hundreds. But what's different in Mankind Divided systems? Well, firstly, the augmentation system has been expanded. Before, we were given access to a multitude of different augmentations that could change our style of play. Each of these a little tweak, upgrade, or another ornament to be added to the Christmas tree, but like a sick ornament that lets you blow stuff up or go invisible. Most of the augmentations we have in the last game have returned, but we have extra augmentations, ones that seem to have miraculously appeared, almost like a gift. These augs are experimental and when used will increase the amount of power consumed by Jensen's system, meaning that we have to balance our power output when activating these. We'll usually have to deactivate another aug to activate one of the experimental ones. This is an interesting system, but most of these augs never really seemed necessary. They were pretty fun for the most part, an omni blade that can be shot out at enemies or the ability to hack things remotely, but there's a side quest that we can complete about halfway through the game that gets rid of this shackle, meaning we can just infinitely equip any of these augments once we get to that point, so the system isn't that constrained. I will say that the augments have the same feeling and use that they did in Human Revolution. They're incredibly useful, they feel fun, and the amount of them give us a large variety to choose from. This provides differing builds which makes the game even more dynamic. Each experience different and Jensen can effectively be tailored to the player themselves. This adds another layer to the immersive sim. The approach of the level isn't the only thing that conforms to the player's whims anymore, but the gameplay itself does too. The cover system has been upgraded slightly, making it easier to use. We can now round corners, hop over cover, or pop to other pieces of cover much easier than before. This is a welcome change, and it was a system that I used quite often throughout the course of my playthrough. We of course can still interact with useless things, we can throw stuff, which for some reason this game's physics system was the one that I fucked around with the most. I can't be too sure why, it just felt really satisfying to whip stuff at walls in this entry. We have a new radial menu that kind of makes the quick select menu at the bottom of the screen useless, but we have both for whatever reason. The UI has also been upgraded overall and looks a lot cleaner. I honestly prefer this design over Human Revolutions by a mile. It's super clean, fine lines are everywhere, very, very minimal, and if we're to think that this is an in-world menu, then it entirely fits with that. Not a ton of flair, just straight information. The game is also heavily upgraded in the graphics department. It looks amazing in general. The world and environments are incredibly detailed, they feel lived in, and the visual style is just stunning. Not talking directly about aesthetics, but with regard to fidelity, this is the best looking Deus Ex game yet. 
There were so many moments in this game that I stopped to just stare at the world. The cutscenes also look a lot better, and it made me realize how much I kind of hated Human Revolution's models. Mankind Divided just looks a lot better in almost every way. Human Revolution does feel a bit more stylized in its world, and I'll certainly give it that, but I can't say I hate looking at this game. There are other small changes, hacking has had a bit of a facelift, as well as some additional mechanic changes, but it's nothing too big. The largest change that Mankind Divided would make will be in the world itself, and the structure of the missions moving forward, but we'll get to those in a bit. Back in our introductory story, Jensen and his team meet some resistance once the meet begins. Gold-masked mercs show up and shoot Shepard, attempting to steal the augmentations in the trade. Here, if we don't make our moves correctly, Sing can die, which is not a game over for us, just a consequence. We can save him or not, but it's entirely up to us. The mission ends in disaster yet again, and we see the Council of Five. This is made up of some familiar faces from the first Deus Ex game. Lucius De Beers, Morgan Everett, Elizabeth Duclair, Stanton Dowd, and one we've never seen, Volcard Rand. This council acts as the Illuminati, the ones we've heard so much about throughout the series. Bob Page is also here, a protege to Morgan Everett at the time. The gold-masked men were working for the Illuminati, and the group itself isn't gaining ground very well. They're having trouble maintaining order, as society has become divided ever since the Og incident. Their next move is to try and get the Human Restoration Act passed, a bill that would require augmented individuals to have a control chip inserted in them. We then see Jensen traveling in Ruzika Station, in the city of Prague. He then meets up with Alex Vega, a woman working for the Juggernaut Collective. This is another group that Jensen is working with. The Juggernaut Collective are a hacktivist organization that is led by Janus, the man we heard reference to in the previous game. Their general goal is to fight corruption, but this mostly ends up pitting them against the Illuminati. Alex and Jensen think that the TF-29 operation in Dubai may have been set up, and Vega gives him a chip to plant in the task force's NSN terminal so that they can hear some important conversations. At this moment, the station is blown up, destroyed by terrorists. Jensen tries to save a mother, but he's too late. She's already crushed under the massive weight of the rubble. This is a pretty important and exciting incident for the game. This event will set up most of our story from here on out. It will also set up quite a few themes for the game and the world moving forward. The world of Mankind Divided is a lot different from that of Human Revolution. In the previous entry, augmentations were a very big part of the game. Obviously, we got them and could use them in combat effectively, but the public seemed pretty mistrusting of them. Augmentations made up most of the themes of the game as well, the big questions being asked all centered around this massive milestone in technological advancement. This game too concerns itself quite a bit with augmentations, but not nearly in the same way. The new world has seen a great division between mankind. Society has been split apart, segregated into those with augments and those without. This is no longer a fringe issue, one that may spring up in the future. There is totalitarian separation between the two groups, and these two groups don't seem to get along very well. Now, of course, I'm not a huge fan of this plot point. I think the idea in practice is probably fine, but the way that it's executed is not just heavy-handed. It's as if the hand has a 12-ton truck on the back of it. The imagery and separation is clear here, and boy did it cause quite a bit of controversy before and on release. The team decided to market the game with a live-action short called Mechanical Apartheid, which people were not too happy about whatsoever. The team also used the term Aug Lives Matter within the game and maintained that it was an unfortunate coincidence. These things all paint a picture, that the team wanted to move the Augs into the realm of racism metaphor, or even anti-Semitism metaphor. But it's really just so overdone. Its execution seems insensitive, corny, and misplaced. 
Now, I understand the goal, but when we compare this game's themes to the themes of the previous entry, it really becomes clear that we've exited the territory of the subtle. Human Revolution asked many questions, like what it meant to be human, what the purpose of control was, and whether humanity could go too far with technology. This game doesn't seem to ask very many questions at all. It seems to just tell you that racism or augism is bad. I don't really find any of it overtly offensive or anything. Maybe the marketing was poorly managed, but it's mostly just a lot more boring. I was kind of disappointed after starting this game and a couple hours into the story, I realized what it was. All I could muster was a meek and meager, that's it. While the situation makes sense, and sure, it's the next logical story beat to make, it seems like the easy one. It's certainly not a challenging narrative setup for the player or for the team itself. There are some interesting things within the story of Mankind Divided that I did enjoy, but its general plot and world was not one of them. Jensen wakes up in his apartment, an area that we can explore quite a bit for some extra items and secrets as per usual. There's a hidden panel with some useful items and a loose floorboard with some goodies underneath. We can also use a TV to contact an old friend, David Seraph. He gives us a side mission that we'll talk about in just a bit. We head to Kohler's facility in Prague, who fixes our augmentations for us. He also notifies us of the experimental augmentations that he found installed. These are the ones we talked about before. He says that they had to have been installed in the past couple of years. It's actually been two years since the end of Deus Ex Human Revolution. The game doesn't specifically canonize any ending from that game. The only thing it really does canonize is the destruction of Panchea. Jensen was found in the ocean and was somehow nursed back to health, fixed yet again. His memories are a bit blurry though, and he doesn't have a great recollection of those events. Our next goal is to head over to TF-29's headquarters, which are actually hidden underneath a store called Praha Dovos. But before we can head over there, we should actually talk about the city that Mankind Divided is set in. Most of the previous games in the series have worked off of a mission structure. We would take a large plane to different missions, heading to vastly different parts of the world. Obviously, Human Revolution broke this mold slightly. Detroit and Hengsha were larger cities that we could freely explore, and we would spend much of our time there. Mankind Divided takes this idea a little bit further with just one city, Prague. This is now our hub city, and most of the game will take place here. We will leave the city a couple times throughout the game, but only briefly, usually for one mission while we head to another area, but we'll quickly be back to Prague. We have tons of side missions we can do here, many vendors that we can trade or buy and sell from, and tons of exploring to do. Now, obviously, this is a great idea for a series like Deus Ex. It takes that immersive sim title just another step further. It adds another dimension to the immersion. Now the environment itself is immersive, and it's easily the best part of the game. There were so many times that I just got lost in the city. Not literally, I just couldn't stop exploring it. I would see an open window and would need to figure out how to get up there. There were a few times where I broke into an apartment and stole a bunch of items, only to realize later that it was a part of a side mission, but there were many times that the things I found never surfaced again. They were just there, meant to be found if we went spelunking through the concrete caves that the city presents us with. Weaving through vents, hacking into garages, and eventually popping out in apartments that you realize are connected back to the beginning of your loop is just wild. I'm sure if exposed to Prague enough, you could eventually come to know this city like the back of your hand, and that's what makes it so gorgeous. The game encourages you to explore as well. We can buy information from vendors or come across it in side quests. These will be marked as points of interest. These are usually apartments that might hold some special items or hidden places that could have some secret equipment. It should also be noted that there's a specific antique store in Prague. It doesn't really have anything special inside, just a cool little portal easter egg. 
Yeah, just a nice reference. That's all. Nothing of importance to my YouTube channel whatsoever. Nothing significant to see here. This basement actually has a bunch of video game covers from other Eidos games. Hitman is here, Tomb Raider, and obviously Legacy of Kane being represented is the most important and prominent to me. Most video game cities are pretty vapid, tons of blank storefronts that were never intended for us to enter. And don't get me wrong, Prague has no shortage of unenterable doors, but the city feels large. It feels like it holds secrets. I put a bunch of hours in one playthrough of this game and add on some more for a New Game Plus run, and I still feel like there are things that the city has kept hidden from me. The place begs to be explored. It's what it was made for. If there's some sort of universal destiny, then Prague was meant to have every avenue of its architecture examined, and you and me were meant to do it. Like New Age cartographers in the undiscovered land of the digital. The city itself also has an aesthetic all of its own. Let's ignore the propaganda posters and augmented segregation for a moment, and we'll find visually striking advertisements that are at once creative and dystopian. They transcend the cyberpunk tropes of screens on buildings and move past it to something new and probably more unfortunately realistic. There are still just screens on buildings every once in a while, but like I said in the development section, this trend exhibits a juxtaposition between the modern and the classical. Just as Human Revolution used the Renaissance as an inspiration for an environment, this game uses classic architecture as a backboard, a comparison for its modern advancements. This comparison is chilling, seeing the creative and passion-fueled art that are the buildings of this ancient city set against the bland and formulaic, bright, poppy, capitalist-fueled advertisements creates a visual that's almost too real. Because it is. Prague overall is amazing, wonderful to explore, but also ready to be unfurled in front of you. Eventually, we head over to the TF-29 headquarters. Here, we plant the bug in the neural subnet and get an assignment from our boss, Miller. He wants us to head over to Ruzika Station to investigate the attack. The Shek police are the ones investigating, so TF-29 doesn't have jurisdiction. We find a forensics tech there named Smiley. There's a storage device inside that holds some evidence Smiley wants us to get. Smiley has to examine the evidence after we give it to him, so it's going to take some time. We're supposed to go talk to Dr. Delara, TF-29's psychiatrist. She asks us some questions to analyze Jensen's emotional state and opinions on what he has to do. Just then, Alex says that they caught something on the bug, and we meet up with her to talk about the contents of the discussions. We find out that Miller was talking to his boss, Joseph Manderley. Manderley told him that he needed to blame the ARC for the train station attack and Dubai. The ARC are the Augmented Rights Coalition. They're a group that, obviously, fights for the rights of augmented individuals. They are suspected to have been involved in some of the terrorism as of late, considering the fact that AUGs haven't been treated very well in society. Just then, Miller gives us a mission to head out to Gollum City, where the ARC are headed. He tells us that some corrupted footage from the train station shows an AUG dropping bombs off in a bag that is commonly used by Talos Rucker, the ARC's leader. This is the point in the game where we begin to mistrust Miller. That fact is made plainly clear. Obviously, the main story sort of pushes us against him. I do like how this was done in Mankind Divided. Like I talked about previously, Human Revolution did a similar thing with Seraph, but it wasn't as overt as it is here. There, it was more of an implication and an assumption on the part of the player, especially if they were used to Deus Ex games. We have to head to Gollum City. As I said before, Gollum City is based on a real-life place called Kowloon Walled City. This was a place in Hong Kong that is actually incredibly interesting. Its origins go back hundreds of years as a military fort. It eventually became a squatting village during the Chinese Civil War. The reason it was so interesting, though, is because it was incredibly densely populated. 
In just this small area, 33,000 people resided. Wildly unsafe with a shockingly low quality of life, the city was eventually demolished in 1994, and Hong Kong turned it into a park. Gollum City shares many similarities with this real-world place. It's densely packed and populated, a refuge made for augmented individuals to flee to. It was originally built to be home to the working class of Prague, but eventually became a ghetto for Augs. Here, we try to gain access to the ARC. We find a man named Tibor who works in their ranks. He gives us some information, and we eventually run into Viktor Marchenko, a higher-ranking member of the group. He warns us to turn back, making some veiled threats in the process. When we finally meet Rucker, he tells us that ARC genuinely had nothing to do with the bombing, or at least, he didn't. He seems honest, like he just wants better for augmented individuals, but there's a power struggle within the group. This is one of our big conversation boss battles in the game. It's a similar system to what we saw in Human Revolution, though this time the alignment analysis system doesn't sit over top of every character's face all of the time. Here, of course, we can either convince Rucker or not. He wants to give us evidence to confirm what he says about ARC, but before he can, he dies, spitting blood and his augs separating from his own body. Jensen has to make a messy exit from the complex, heading back to Prague. He's quite frustrated at what just happened because he feels like he was set up. He thinks that someone sent him there to frame him for Rucker's death. Jensen really doesn't know who to trust at this moment. Things are starting to get really murky, and anyone could be an enemy. Fletcher has decoded the DSD, though, and it's time to see what was on it. Before we do that, though, I'd like to talk about the side quests of Mankind Divided. Human Revolution had some great side missions, and Mankind Divided honestly doesn't disappoint in this regard. Most of the side missions are missable, meaning as we progress through the story, if we don't pick them up and complete them, they're gone. A lot of them also continue throughout the story. The single one that we talked about so far, the important mission to remove the shackles from your experimental augmentations, is picked up early on, but can only be completed once we've progressed through the story. These objectives do a good job at building the world of Deus Ex a little better, though. One very interesting mission for me was the Samizdat mission. This begins when we found out that someone has hacked TF-29's front company. We have to track them down and eventually source it to a small conspiracy publication that's being run out of the sewers. We have to keep them from exposing TF-29 and can even get some dirt on Picus by raiding a nearby bank in Prague. This dirt happens to be some flight dossiers of a shot-down airplane. The most interesting part of this side mission for me, though, was the conversation we have with the group's leader, K. Samizdat thinks that they know what's going on. They think that they know that the media is being controlled or that things are being covered up. It sort of parallels the real world. There are tons of people that think they've cracked the code. What's happening behind the scenes is a child's riddle to them. They already know. But Jensen reveals that it's so much more complicated than they could ever imagine. They aren't even close. Could they ever even fathom that Picus is actually run by an artificial intelligence that diverts the public's attention? It's this reflection of the modern world and real life that makes this little group so interesting. I found it so genuine and honest. There's also the incredibly interesting side mission where we have to track down a serial killer that's been ripping people's augs out. The short story tries to give us a red herring and convince us that it's the lead officer that's actually doing the killings, but we find out that it's the latest victim's sister, who kidnaps herself to lure out Jensen. But when we take her down, the lead officer thinks we must be the killer. This was one of the few times that I didn't manage to win a conversation battle in this game, and the officer ended up attacking me. I was forced to take him down. This was not a favorable result at all. Jensen actually has to call Chang at TF-29 and tell him that there's two people dead here and they needed picked up. A lot of these little stories are very interesting, just a really nice fine-tuning of missions and systems throughout the course of this series. I think a lot of these little stories are more interesting and actually work better than the main story does, to be honest. 
Speaking of side missions, there is a side mission involving David Seraph, who has now had to sell off Seraph Industries after the heat with augmentations. He's trying to help Jensen find out what happened to him back in Panchea or Alaska and how he got these experimental augmentations. But wait, that doesn't sound like David Seraph. One day, people will move on from the incident, and when that happens, we'll be ready for it. I'm glad we caught up, Adam. I've always tried to look out for you, you know. Sounds just a bit off, doesn't it? That's because it is. Rick Miller did the voice for David Seraph in this entry, not Stephen Shellen. Miller is just doing a good enough impression of Shellen to pass if you weren't paying attention. Now, I did a little digging on this, and there's actually a lot more here than you'd think. There was some fuss in 2012 because Shellen had uploaded a video where he was rambling about Area 51, the Illuminati, and fruit flies. The video itself was part of some sort of comedy channel and was actually a skit. People didn't realize it was a skit at first, though, and publications started reporting that Shellen was having some sort of meltdown. This wasn't true, though, and apparently, again, according to Shellen, there was a disagreement about pay with Eidos, and he decided not to come back for the sequel game. Ironically, Shellen was then actually blacklisted from Hollywood and started to have a legit breakdown. He started posting conspiracy videos and was, of course, pretty outspoken in 2020 about a certain virus and masks. My whole point here is that the conspiracy has truly permeated the game and seeped into the real world. Mankind Divided is so genius because it's created its own real world conspiracy. I genuinely just thought this was relevant because Seraph's voice sounded so off in the sequel and I ended up going down a rabbit hole of useless information. Once we head back to Fletcher, he tells us that the timing mechanism on one of the bombs was from a Stanek wristwatch, a local company in Prague. We have to track down the man behind the shop who isn't very easy to find as he's currently being targeted by some local gang assassins. We eventually meet him in a bar and he reveals that his daughter was the one making the bombs, not him. She used to be in the military on bomb disposal and had hallucinations. She was discharged and became depressed. Stanek thinks her new friends are to blame. We can actually head to Miller's apartment since Jensen's distrust with him is at an all-time high. At this point in the game, doing main story missions in a certain order will give us differing outcomes, further altering each playthrough. We actually don't find anything on Miller as the evidence shows us that he's looking for information himself. We meet Alex again, who tells us that a similar death was found to Rutgers. A woman was poisoned at VersaLife, and it was made to look like an accident. The two think the culprit is a bioweapon called Orchid. The only way to find out is to access Miller's neural subnet. This is incredibly risky, but the rewards outweigh that risk. We access the NSN and we have to interface with a brand new mode called Breach. Now, this whole section is actually kind of interesting. We're using an avatar in a sort of digital world, interfacing with information. It's really interesting, and sort of vaguely reminds me of that small section at the end of Invisible War. We have to steal some data using hacking and platforming to get past different firewalls and security measures. It's not a bad little section, but there's two problems with it. First, it's literally the only appearance of this in the main story. Just looking at the main missions, this is completely isolated and makes almost no sense. It seems very out of place to just have this style of mission one time. I kept thinking it was going to reappear again, and it never did. The other problem is that Breach is really just an introduction to another mode available for Mankind Divided, Breach Mode. This was sort of the multiplayer mode for this game. It wasn't really multiplayer, mostly a challenge mode that saw you competing against other players and leaderboards. Each breach level sees us going through defenses and essentially solving a puzzle to get to the server data as fast as we can and escaping as fast as we can. We can choose our loadout before we start, choose modifiers for the missions to make it easier or harder. We can even buy a nice little booster packs for small amounts of money that will give us a variety of items and skins. It's a very weird addition to the game that seems almost unnecessary. The game was actually made a standalone free product as well. It mostly seems like a way to get some extra money. 
Not to mention there are actually microtransactions that are in the single player game itself. There was certainly some shifty business going on with Mankind Divided. According to an anonymous source, most of these microtransactions overall were sprung on Eidos weeks before the game was to be finished. They had no idea that they were going to be implemented or were required at all until the final weeks of production. This doesn't surprise me considering the time when the game came out was sort of the heyday for this sort of thing. After we get through the breach, we see the other half of the conversation Miller was having with Manderley. Miller logs off and Bob Page logs on. Apparently we were wrong not to trust Miller because he has no involvement with the Illuminati and doesn't even know he's working for them. They had an inside man at the ARC and poisoned Rucker with Orchid. This will apparently force Nathaniel Brown's hand. Nathaniel B. is the CEO of the Santau Group, who are currently working on a construction called Rabia, an entire city that would be meant for augmented individuals. Jensen heads to meet Janus, who won't actually show his face, just an ever-switching series of other people's faces. Janus wants us to head to the Palisade Bank and break into VersaLife's vault. There could be some information on VersaLife there. We're cut off from Janus and have to escape from some sentry drones. We actually have two options here moving forward in regards to missions. We can either go save Stanek's daughter, who he has tracked down, or we can head to the vault. I decided to save Allison, as she was supposedly the bomb maker and could have some information on who was behind all this. When we go here, we find Allison in the throes of a wild cult that's about to go through with their ascension ritual, moving past the physical world and into the machine god. We can convince her to stay and talk her down. Eventually, she'll tell us about a facility in the Swiss Alps called Garm. If we head to the VersaLife vault, we can actually hear footage of Megan Reed talking to Bob Page, informing him about the dangers of the orchid which she's created. Either way, we get the same information. It's just about the way that it happens. We head to Garm and are quickly ambushed by Marchenko. He injects Jensen with Orchid, which Adam luckily survives. We have to escape the place, picked up by our pilot. We head back to Prague one final time to find that the city has fallen into the tendrils of martial law. <coughs> no, not that martial law. This is not good for us because a curfew has been instituted. We can no longer roam freely throughout the streets of Prague. We now have to sneak our way through. This is where those vents, hidden pathways, weaving through buildings, and all-around detail-heavy city comes in handy. This is also something to be expected. Even though it is interesting and welcome, this is sort of a staple for the Deus Ex series. This whole concept of turning our safe area into a dangerous one was pioneered by the first game back when we had to escape from UNATCO. We give Alex the sample of Orchid so that the Juggernaut Collective can examine the substance. ARC is being set up as a scapegoat for the upcoming attack that Marchenko is planning. Miller tells us that he's just as in the dark as us. He tells us that Marchenko is connected to the Diwali, a Shek gang that operates out of Eastern Europe. We find out that Marchenko is going to attack a large convention tomorrow in London. This convention is being held by Nathaniel Brown himself. We meet Alex back at Jensen's apartment. She's found out that Brown is going to lose money if the Human Restoration Act passes. It would mean a massive influx of people to Rabia, and thus, he's been campaigning against it. Killing Brown will guarantee the act gets passed. We head out to London for our final mission of the game. We go with Miller and a team to London's Apex Center, where the convention is being held. Brown, stupidly, doesn't want to call off the event. He wants to keep it going because he thinks it will show the terrorists that they can't stop him. We eventually find out that the gold masks have already invaded and replaced the actual guards. We can take out the fake guards, and this is where the ending gets tricky. The moment that we're noticed, Marchenko contacts us and tells us to head to him. He won't set off his explosives he has placed in the next building if we come to meet him now. But regardless, his soldiers begin firing upon civilians. We can do these things in multiple different orders, which will affect what actually happens. Miller's fate is dependent on whether we have an antidote for his poisoning. The delegates can be saved or killed, and we eventually will fight Marchenko himself. This is the only actual boss fight in the entire game. This was probably in response to most people actually hating the boss fights in Human Revolution. 
There's also a lot of ways we can take out Marchenko. In a throwback to the original Deus Ex, we can actually get a kill switch for Marchenko that will automatically kill him. We can also just EMP him and take him out with a stealth takedown or shoot him in the head a million times. Regardless, we jump ahead to one week later. Jensen is in his apartment with Alex. They watch the news and learn about the act and whether it passed or not. Jensen is determined to find out who is behind everything and who Janus is. We see a Picus news report on current events, which is affected by the decisions that we made throughout the game. We have one more scene of the council meeting again, talking about what happened in London. We find out that Delara, the psychiatrist from TF29, is actually involved in the Illuminati herself. Jensen is being watched closely, and so is his meeting with Janus. The entire ending to this game is just really awkward. I do think that they achieved their goal here and made the thing open so that players could approach it how they wanted, but in doing so, I think it sacrifices a lot of cohesion in the story. Even the final mission just ends really strangely and is very abrupt. It's an odd choice, and I just wish they had wrapped it up better. Not only that, but the last we see of Jensen and this crusade of his to find Janus is also pretty odd. It felt like the game wanted to set up another entry more than they actually wanted to finish this one. Assumingly, this was setting up the final entry in a trilogy, but it just feels like this disjointed, awkward middle piece. This wasn't the final ending for Mankind Divided, though. There are still a couple other things to talk about in the form of DLC. This game did have its fair share of downloadable supplements. Before we talk about those, we should actually talk about Mankind Divided's pre-order bonuses. There was an incredibly confusing system that Square had determined for the game where you can choose rewards for your pre-order at different tiers. You could eventually get early release of the game, but it was also convoluted and honestly pretty predatory towards the consumer. People complained, and rightly so, so they cancelled it and offered everyone who pre-ordered all of the rewards. This must have been another one of those things that Square forced on Eidos. One of these pre-order bonuses, though, was an extra in-game mission. It would later become available to everyone as a free download and can now be played under the DLC menu in Mankind Divided. This was called Desperate Measures and is literally just a side mission, but played as a weird little one-off thing. It's very short and disjointed when played on its own. The whole thing revolves around us trying to figure out why the footage of the train station bombing was corrupted. It's an alright story, but should have just been included in the base game in the first place. The second DLC is called System Rift, and was released a month after the game itself. The idea is pretty cool. Pritchard contacts Jensen to help him out with another job, infiltrating the Palisade Blade, which is a data storage facility for highly sensitive information. That part of the DLC is interesting, and it contains an entirely new area, which is nice. Also, seeing Pritchard and Jensen's weird little bantering comeback was also a neat surprise. But half of the DLC is literally a lore explanation as to why the Breach mode exists. It's so odd, and I wish they wouldn't force Breach into the story at all. If you're going to have a cash grab, just make it a cash grab. Don't try to rationalize it. The third DLC, A Criminal Past, is actually the most interesting one of the bunch. It's framing devices Jensen telling the TF-29 psychiatrist stories about his past. He tells her about his first mission with the task force, one where he had to infiltrate a high-security prison that's super remote in Arizona. Actually, an incredibly interesting design. The only problem is that it's called the Penthouse. But the full name is actually, um, the, uh, Penley T. Housefather Correctional Facility. What in the Charles Entertainment Cheese? In reality, though, this DLC is actually really interesting. The prison is a good and interesting environment. We even have our augments removed at the beginning of the game, which adds some challenge to the whole thing. We can get them back pretty easily, but there's some genuine downsides to having them. It's just a really nice change of pace and a really good piece of content. Deus Ex Mankind Divided is, overall, 
A flawed beast, one that can pounce on its prey at one moment, tearing sinew from bone, efficiently eviscerating, but yet can't manage to sip water from a stream. The game manages to be so incredibly interesting and fun to play. The environments are beautiful and so well crafted. There's so much detail here, so much intrigue, so much to do and find. The things that we can do in those environments are incredibly fun as well. This game remembers the best thing that Deus Ex is all about, and it's giving me the ability to be creative in its world, allowing me to try and break the simulation, challenging me to it, even. The game is incredibly replayable, too. Going back to revisit missions and objectives means finding new ways to solve them, maybe ways that are even more efficient, better than the first failed playthrough. But on top of everything, Mankind Divided is genuinely fun. The story itself is not that interesting. If you remember way back when I was talking about Deus Ex at the beginning of the series, I talked about the art of the conspiracy theory. That is totally and completely gone from this game. Don't get me wrong at all, I think going in a new direction is great for the series. I think that with Human Revolution, the team really decided that they were going to try something new with this world. That game's story was very far removed from what the original Deus Ex had done, but at least it had felt like it had something else interesting to offer. If you're going to take things away, then you have to offer something else that's going to make up for it. Mankind Divided doesn't really feel like it offers anything to make up for it in terms of narrative. It has moments of being interesting, but overall it's sort of boring. It doesn't accomplish much, and it doesn't ask any important questions. Maybe the only question it asks is not even a question, just a statement. If it is asking a question, then it's asking one that people have already answered, or at the very least, one that no one cares to have a conversation about. The most interesting thing about these games, one of the things that's tied them together up until this point, is that they all seem to have something to say. Mankind Divided doesn't really feel like that. It seems like it's trying to say things that other people have said, but with the new Deus Ex. It's very odd. And the catch-22 with the entire game is that the game is just so damn fun to play. It might be my preferred Deus Ex to play outside of the first game. And honestly, with how the first game performs on my machine, if I'm inclined to just pick up a Deus Ex game for a few hours, it honestly might be this one. Because overall, there's just more here for me to find, more here for me to do, more for me to see. And getting lost in an interesting city is way more enjoyable than something like Detroit. Human Revolution was great, but this game just did that aspect of it much better. Mankind Divided sits somewhere in the middle for me. It's a real shame in general, because it could have been something great. Mankind Divided was met with pretty decent reviews. Most people praised its design and structure, but some had issues with its narrative. The game itself sold decently, though not as well as Human Revolution. It didn't seem to be a total disaster, though, because it was reported that Mankind Divided was one of the reasons for Square Enix's net profit increase in 2016. There would not be another mainline entry to the Deus Ex series after Mankind Divided. But before we talk about the end of the Deus Ex series, we have a few more things to go over, like a Deus Ex spin-off mobile game, multiple novels, and comics. The last actual playable game that we have to talk about is Deus Ex The Fall. It was developed by N-Fusion Interactive, a company that's known for publishing so much junk and shovelware, they might as well have a landfill behind their offices. The idea for this game was conceived after Human Revolution was declared a success, out of the need to expand the lore of the world, or so they say. Fans weren't exactly happy when the game was announced, but Square Enix was adamant that the game wasn't meant to be a light version of Human Revolution, but a console-level experience on mobile devices. The game was released on iOS on July 11th, 2013, Android on January 22nd, 2014, and Windows on March 18th, 2014. I actually played the PC version of this game, obviously because it was the easiest to come by and get footage of. 
I just want to say up front, this game is not as bad as some mobile game spinoffs that I've played. Now, the bar for that statement isn't terribly high. It's not a good game by any means, and playing the game directly contradicts everything that Square Enix was trying to convince fans of before the release. It is a light version of Deus Ex Human Revolution, and is not a console-level experience. The game functions quite a lot like Deus Ex Human Revolution, except with some changed controls, removed functionality, and way worse graphics. Levels are also way shorter, there's less to be explored here, and much less variety than a mainline Deus Ex game. The overall experience is incredibly short as well. It only lasts a couple of hours if we don't include side quests, which don't really pad out the runtime that much anyways. The story itself might be the worst part of the game, though. It acts as a sequel to a book that we'll be talking about in a moment called Deus Ex Icarus Effect. The game and the book center around two characters, Ben Saxon and Anna Kelso. Ben Saxon is reflecting on the times that he worked with the tyrants, the ones we see in Human Revolution. A lot of the game sees us trying to track down Neuropazine. The scenario itself is short, odd, and unevenly paced, but the writing is the worst offender. The dialogue sounds like it was all collectively written in one drunken evening. It's incredibly off-putting. I can't put all of it on the writers, though, because the voiceover artists don't do a very good job at giving these words life. They work in the shadows. It's what they're good at. I know, because I used to be one of them. The only way to stop them is to wipe them out. What happened to you, Ben? Before Geneva, what was it like to be a tyrant? What did you see? Tell me about him. The whole game is really unnecessary. It doesn't really provide us any needed context to the world, and taking these characters from book to video game was also unnecessary. Mobile games were the big hot thing back then, and Square Enix decided they wanted Deus Ex to be in on it. End of story. There were a couple books and a few stories released in the Deus Ex universe. Four tales in total, two books, and two novellas. They were all penned by James Swallow. Swallow has an incredibly lengthy list of work in and out of this industry. Most importantly, he co-wrote a lot of Human Revolution and Mankind Divided. He also worked on games like No Man's Sky, Fable the Journey, and Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. He's written tons of tie-in novels for series like Warhammer 40k, Doctor Who, Stargate, and Splinter Cell. He has his own original works. He's written scripts for loads of audio dramas and TV. The guy has a resume a mile long when it comes to writing. The first work that Swallow contributed to the Deus Ex universe was the aforementioned Deus Ex Icarus Effect. This book makes Deus Ex The Fall even more contradictory, mostly because a lot of the events from the mobile game take place in this book. The two accounts actually have conflicting events. The book again follows Saxon and Kelso. We get tons of appearances from people we know, like De Beers, Morgan Everett, Bob Page, and even Gunther Herman. The end of the book leads into and hints about a lot of the things that happen in Deus Ex's past. The AIDS cure, the D project, and the earthquakes that would eventually rack California. The book itself isn't the worst as far as tie-in novels go. I just want to say this for future reference though. Most of the time, if I say a tie-in novel is good, that doesn't mean I would even recommend it. Unless you're a massive fan of the series already. Most of these books don't have the best writing, and I would recommend reading something competent most of the time, because these books usually just don't hold up very well when compared to actual novels. They're usually pretty pulpy and can be massively corny. The next piece of media that Swallow would go on to write for Deus Ex was Deus Ex Fallen Angel. It was released in 2013 and was just a short novella. It provides a short backstory to Malik from Human Revolution. In particular, it references a lot of the information that we learn in her side quest, Shanghai Justice, from that game. The story itself actually ends with her heading to work with Seraph. The last full-length novel in the Deus Ex universe was called Deus Ex Blacklight, and was released in August of 2016, the same time that Mankind Divided was released. 
This book again is fine and isn't really an amazing read, but is almost entirely necessary to read if you want to understand what happened to Adam Jensen. So it turns out the whole big mystery of mankind divided, what happened to Jensen after the end of human revolution, mostly lies in this book. The book picks up with Jensen waking up in a WHO facility in Alaska. He's been in a coma for a while and Adam has to eventually escape. This culminates in Jensen's rendezvous with Pritchard, which is heavily referenced in the System Rift DLC. The whole thing is kind of par for the course with Mankind Divided. The game itself was really broken up and truncated. It feels like bites of that game's story were taken out and put into other places. The DLC, the book, it just doesn't really scream integrity when you have to get answers from a tie-in novel. The last story that Swallow wrote for Deus Ex was Deus Ex Hardline. It was another short novella, this time centering around Alex Vega. The story is a prequel to Mankind Divided and mostly concerns itself with Vega's recollections. She remembers different things from her past, even crossing paths with Ben Saxon. Again, it's just fine writing, it isn't anything special or remarkable. This one also doesn't particularly matter that much because of its subject matter. Vega wasn't exactly the most interesting character to center a story on. There were technically three comics written for Deus Ex. The first was called Deus Ex Human Revolution and was obviously a tie-in to the game with the same title. It was released by DC Comics of all places and written by Robbie Morrison. The comic story actually takes place somewhere in the middle of the game's story. The implication is, if canon, that Jensen just went off and did some other stuff for a bit in the middle of the game and we didn't see it. The whole thing is alright. I think the largest place it suffers is in its art, though. It doesn't really look that great. Though a bit stylized, its theme differs largely from the games, creating an odd gap in design between the two. The second comic, Deus Ex Children's Crusade, was a five-issue limited series published by Titan Comics. It was written by Alex Irvine, with art by John Eggs. The story is a prequel to Mankind Divided, and supposedly is Jensen's first outing with Task Force 29. The story sees him clashing heads with Duncan McCready, another agent in the Task Force. McCready doesn't like Oggs, and therefore doesn't like Jensen. The art here is a little better, albeit a little cartoony. It doesn't really feel like it fits much with the Deus Ex universe in general, especially with the newer games. I really wish they would have made comics for the earlier Deus Ex games. I feel like those games could have lent themselves really well to a graphic novel form. Those early aesthetics and design could have looked great on paper. The books themselves also would have worked better in that era. Imagine the lengthy real-world conspiracies discussed in depth. We could even follow around other UNATCO agents, maybe a book or comic bridging the gap between the old and the new eras. Of course, none of this is exactly realistic or possible because both of these universes have been neglected for a while now. The final comic to be released in the Deus Ex universe was called Deus Ex The Dawning Darkness. It was a one-shot comic written again by Alex Irvine, this time following Singh, the man we see at the beginning of Mankind Divided. There's really not much to say about this one, really short and really unnecessary. Deus Ex is a series that will forever live in infamy. None of the later entries in the series, good or bad, can surpass the looming shadow of the first entry. None of the games would go on to live up to its success, in my opinion. They did all surely try, though. They tried to put their own spin on the innovation that Deus Ex had introduced to the world. They each wanted to etch their names into the annals of video game history as Deus Ex once had. But that is no easy task. It's not as simple as grabbing a chisel and hammering away. You have to actually get in first. Getting in is what all of the Deus Ex games are about. Infiltration, subterfuge, trigger pulling, or trigger discipline. These split decisions at every avenue make these games what they are. Regardless of the quality of each respective entry, the series itself is something incredibly special. Playing these games in the present day feels like a joy. It feels at once like a challenge, but an honor to be challenged by a creation like this. Each of these games, whether good or bad, respect their player. In the modern gaming landscape, it can often feel like we're made out to be dumb. 
We're just the player, one holding that piece of plastic, or jamming away at those keys, or rubbing your greasy fingers on that touch screen. We know nothing. We exist to consume the content, the media. We must be told what to do. Not only must we be told what to do, we must be told exactly how to do it, precisely. Otherwise, we'll be seen smashing that piece of plastic on the ground, gorilla hands flinging and flying keys and buttons. We are not capable. We interact with this media to get a rush. A rush from killing, a rush from completing, a rush from leveling up, and not much else. But Deus Ex doesn't swallow this pill of presupposition. It doesn't assume the player needs anything, any help. It doesn't force the player to do anything they don't want to do. Sure, the later games may guide us gently with a loving hand on the back, like a gentle father, but they never push. We are given the freedom to explore, the freedom to care about a game, a level, an environment, free to become a part of the machine, to let it become our god, to worship it. After Deus Ex Mankind Divided was released, it seemed to fade into the ether, like a once long reigning champion of a combat sport now forgotten and unrespected. Its glory days were long behind it, and now only its failures could be remembered. Rumors that the series was cancelled began to circulate. Eidos had begun to move on to other series. Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy were their priority titles. But fans were assured that Deus Ex wasn't being left in the dust. On May 2nd, 2022, Eidos Montreal was sold to Embracer Group. This meant that the rights to series like Tomb Raider, Legacy of Kane, and Deus Ex were being sold to the Swedish holding company. This was honestly a ray of hope for many fans of these series that had been lying dormant for quite a long time. This was a ray of hope in the darkness. It may not be for quite a while, but we may see Deus Ex pop its head back up again someday. And its announcement will arrive as good news for the fans that still remember the glory days of the champion's legacy. Bye, Dad. Hey, Dad. Uh, just really quickly wanted to thank you so much for watching the video. Um, and closing out the Deus Ex series with me. With that, it means we'll be moving on to, uh, to other series, and I actually plan to do a few one-off uh, retrospectives for the next couple videos, and then uh, I think I'm going to start multiple series and uh, kind of bounce back and forth to create some variety on the channel so that we're not uh, stuck in one series for months if uh if somebody doesn't want to um see a specific series we can bounce back and forth between other ones um i think it'll it'll make it a, a little more varied and a little better i also want to give a huge shout out to icaro gabriel 17 on twitter who um made the title cards for this video um the the little animations in between each section they look beautiful they're amazing um and he's just a fantastic motion designer so check him out again thank you guys so much for watching and i will see you next time bye dad